Good. This is the May 1st uh, meeting of Yellow Springs Village Council. Happy May Day, everyone. Uh, we've already called the roll. We were in executive session uh, before uh, this meeting. Um, first, we have uh, announcements. And I see we have two guests here. We have uh, Jeff Brock from Green Memorial Hospital and uh, uh, Green Medical Foundation and Dale Bruner from the Greater Dayton YWCA. YMCA, excuse me. <laughs> thank you all for the opportunity to share with you this evening. I particularly thank you to Karen Wintrow for this opportunity. What uh, Dale Bruner is presenting to you is a uh, white paper on a project that's being known across Greene County as the REACH Center. And if you look on page 13, you'll see that this center will be located in Xenia. And uh, if you look on page 19, you'll see that the scope of service of this center actually reaches into Yellow Springs. So we thought it very important to come to you this evening to make sure that you were aware of this. You might hear more across the county or in your interactions with others here in Yellow Springs who become familiar with this project. You will see by the summary on the front page that the acronym REACH stands for Recreation, Education, Activity, Community, and Health Center. And it's a collaboration of six um, partners, primarily centered around Kettering Health Network and the YMCA of Greater Dayton. But you also see that Clark State is involved, Central State, the Xenia Adult Recreation and Service Center, which we just simply call the Senior Center, and the City of Xenia as well. And there might be other partners who join us later in the future. But these six partners have come together to offer a common service center with uh, its various components, some a shared space, some distinct space, to make for a dynamic center that offers uh, all of these services from education to activity to health care to community wellness. And I'm going to pause there because the greatest <coughs> share and partner in this is the YMCA of Greater Dayton, and Dale can talk you through the specific partner associations with this. So Dale, come forward. Again, thanks for your time today. Uh, just to briefly talk about the why for a minute. Uh, <coughs> we've tried to do everything in partnership since 2000. Uh, so we, uh, just as Jeff mentioned about the partners in this particular YMCA uh, and this whole center, uh, we have different partners across the region. So if you go down to our Springboro location, we're partnered with a hospital partner and a church. You go out to our Preble County location, uh, we're partnered with Kettering Health Network, uh, we're partnered with Sinclair Community College, and then of course the Y. Um, you go to our Huber Heights location, it's the same thing. We're with Kettering Health Network in Sinclair, and then um, over to uh, Inglewood, same thing. So everything we try to do is in partnership. Uh, we were just coming today just to update you on the project. Uh, we just kicked off a capital campaign for the project. Um, as of Wednesday, last Wednesday night, uh, we are uh, about $14.5 million raised for the campaign uh, on a $17 million campaign. Um, so we're just for that last $2.5 million is where we're at right now. Each of the partners has uh, a specific space within the building. Uh, so both college partners would have 4,500 square feet. Uh, the senior center would have uh, about 10,000 square feet and the YMCA would have about 36,000 square feet. Um, the whole goal is to create workforce development across our region uh, with the college partners working with Kettering Health Network. Um, and then our goal, of course, is to make sure that when the people would like to use uh, the college's services for higher education, the Y could be there to offer some babysitting for the kids and parents uh, at that time, so a safe place for them to be while their parents are taking classes at the Y for the non-traditional student, so to speak. Um, so this is an exciting partnership for us. Uh, we have 22 people currently working on the capital campaign right now. Uh, as I said, it kicked off last Wednesday, and we're going to meet every three weeks. Uh, the goal is to break ground of this facility uh, by December of 2017. Um, some of the funding for this project, uh, the, um, the Xenia where it's located at, um, we were lucky enough that, uh, first of all, Kettering Health Network purchased the, the land that we have that we'll sit on. Uh, there's around 35 acres of land right next to uh, Walmart and um, Lowe's right on 35. 
uh, so we'll be back out on the highway there. That falls into what's called new market tax credits. We were eligible for new market tax credits, so uh, we applied for them because of the demographics of that area. And we were awarded um, $9.5 million in new market tax credits for the project. Now keep in mind, when you say $9.5 million, it sounds really, really great, which it is. Uh, but once that all the fees and everything's uh, unwound, it's about 2.5 million that will actually go to the project. So, really? I don't wanna, <laughs> so, uh, but we're excited to get started. Uh, a lot of people are working on this, and it's been um, about two and a half years of us uh, talking about this particular project, and we're finally at the point for the capital campaign to start. So, again, just wanted to come here and uh, give you a quick update. Is there any questions at all that we can answer for you on this? Can you say a little more about the services? I mean, it seems very broad. Sure. Uh, so uh, full service Y from a um, eight lane lap pool to gymnasium to free weights to um, cardio equipment, uh, nursery services, multi-purpose room, um, you know, just the normal YMCA. Uh, the actual colleges will have classrooms, so currently if you were to go to our Huber Heights Y or, or Kleps Y, Sinclair has about 15,000 square feet. So these will be much smaller uh, footprints, but it's 4,500 square feet for Clark State and Central State at this time, unless they were to change them. So they would offer classes in the, in the, in the building. And then the Senior Center does everything from offering um, rides to uh, providing meals to the seniors of Greene County, and then also they have a, a whole bunch of rooms and cafeteria area for people to eat or for people to play small, small quiet activities. So that's really and what about are there health services? Yes. Um, so so right now the uh, Kettering Health Network is working on right the plan as of right now is to put a 17,000 square foot building. Uh, to have some docs in the particular building, also some physical therapy uh, and other services as needed for the community. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great project. I mean, it just sounds like yeah. a great collaboration, great team being put together, good location for the, for the county. Um, and I would expect that there will be some Yellow Springs folks using it. We do love our Antioch College Wellness Center, but sure. um, you know, it sounds like with the collaboration with the, with the universities that there could be some additional yeah. offerings that could be. And you said that those were, were re related more to workforce training? Yeah, specifically the goal would be to help the workforce development for the county, uh, but it will go in correlation with the services offered by Kettering Health Network as well. Great. Any other questions? Questions from citizens? Yeah, how, how would that affect the wellness center? I personally don't think it will. I mean, I think our, our folks love the, the proximity of, of Yellow Springs, and I think that, that locals use the, the wellness center. Um, I think we, some folks did go to the Xenia Y when the wellness center closed, but I think that most have come back. Um, to the wellness center, so I see it as an enhancement. I don't as, as an as an additional offering. I don't see it as a threat to the wellness center personally. And actually, it's about two and a half miles further away from where the current location is right now. Thank you, Thank you both, both Thank very you much. Very Thanks much. a lot. And you're very welcome to sit here for another couple hours to listen to the rest of our meeting. Tomorrow is a very important day. It's election day. Um, I believe uh, that Brian has a few comments he wants to make about a couple of the issues that are on the uh, ballot for Yellow Springs. Yeah, and, and in fact, if, if everyone doesn't know, there are two issues on the ballot. And I just want to remind everyone, if uh, you haven't had time to read the literature for our schools, that is a renewal levy. This is for day-to-day -day operations. And the other levy that is on the ballot is for the new uh, Miami Township Fire and Rescue Station. And uh, I think it's really important to remember that uh, per $100,000 value of your home, it will add $85 a year, $84 a year. So uh, please go out and vote. Uh, the voting stations are AUM, and uh, these brochures, by the way, are outside as well. Um, I have a few other announcements. Sure. Uh, so May Day also marks uh, Bike Month, 
and uh, a lot of exciting stuff going is going on. Um, if you were not at our trail de town designation ceremony uh, last Thursday, um, there was a statewide resolution passed for the year of the trail. Green County passed a year of the trail resolution. Yellow Springs followed up, and uh, the state of Ohio has now done that, um, uh, courtesy of uh, Representative Rick Perales, who was there at the dedication. Um, Bike to School Day is on May 10th, so uh, make sure to watch out for all our kids that are going to be biking that day, both to Mills Lawn <coughs> and uh, McKinney and the high school. And um, I just wanted to highlight a couple uh, free events that are happening. The Miami Valley Cycling Summit is this Friday. Uh, that's at Wright State University this year. And a uh, great lineup of speakers. Actually, I'm speaking. Um, and uh, yes. see, uh, about the economic benefit of trails. Um, also, the International Trail Summit, which is a symposium which is coming to Dayton, starts on Sunday, May 7th. There is a free public day uh, at the convention center where you can see all kinds of trail building equipment and how those are set up. And on Monday, there is the Trails Rock Party at Riverscape that's also free and open to the public. So lots of great stuff uh, happening with active transportation. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else? I just wondered if Patty would uh, tell people about the Swimming for All program. Uh, Sure, the Swimming for All program is available to uh, those with limited income uh, to provide discount pool passes. And if you believe that you qualify for this or would like to find out if you qualify for this, please contact my office. Ruth Ann will be happy to, to talk to you about that. And pool passes are available pool pass, now? Pool passes are available uh, from noon to nine downstairs in the, uh, in the youth center until the pool opens Memorial Day weekend, at which point they will be available only at the pool during operating hours. And what day is that the pool will be opening? And what time? It is the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, which makes it the 25th, I believe. And I am not sure about the time, but I am 27. 27. 27. Yeah. And I'm guessing it is at noon, which is the time it normally opens. 11. 11? Oh, is that a Saturday? Yes. Okay, then it's noon, sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. Hope everybody's looking forward to it. Hope it'll be a nice weekend for the pool to open. Um, so, did everyone get an opportunity to read the revised minutes? I'm not sure if we should do it as a consent agenda since there were changes sent. Did everybody see those? I did. Okay. Um, Chris, can we, should we just go ahead and not do it as a consent agenda because Judy sent out some changes to the minutes. Go ahead and do it outside. Okay. And you know what? You do not have revised. You don't have revised stuff at your table. Okay. So we can just shoot it on to the next one. Okay. We? So we won't have minutes um, for this last meeting. Okay. Thanks. Um, next is a review of the agenda. We do have one item to add. We have another resolution. Resolution 2017-21 to add to public hearings and legislation. Um, anything else that we want to change with the agenda? Um, I had wanted to suggest that we move our staff uh, reports to an earlier spot, uh, maybe right after legislation, uh, just because I think uh, the staff reports are very important in terms of what staff's doing and often it's way at the end of the meeting when people are already left and so people don't really get the information. Okay, so let's put staff reports after public hearings of legislation. Do we need to add the nominations for the Economic Sustainability Commission? Um, we could do that. Let's add that under new business. And the Tecumseh Land Trust request. We'll add that also. Okay, anything else? And then, Brian, will you review the petitions and communications, please? Yes. Um, so we received <clears throat> two letters, uh, one from Barbara Mann and one from Suzanne Oldham, uh, asking council not to regulate Airbnbs uh, because they add a lot of value, and, and we've discussed that at council table um, uh, in recent meetings. Um, uh, the letter from Mikasa Sims that uh, Jerry highlighted at the last meeting uh, is officially in this time, which 
was talking about uh, how excited the kids were to have uh, Chief Carlson uh, there to um, to uh, support them with their field trip. Um, we also received a letter from Jeff Reich, who highlighted the importance of having supervision uh, during all shifts uh, with the PD, as well as Sharon Moeller, who um, uh, discussed the importance of understanding uh, what the role of the chief was and, and what our goals were as, as a village and our values. Um, and the last letter that's not on the agenda was from Mike and Carol McKeever um, supporting hiring uh, Brian Carlson for the permanent chief position. Okay. Oh, and I'm oh, sorry, Green County Public Health. Uh, an exciting press release that talks about how we now have in Green County a federally qualified health center, um, which brings a lot of benefits to Green County. There's a three page um, press release about that in the packet. Uh, very interesting services and really important for Green County. Uh, first one locally here. Thanks, Brian. Uh, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2017-09 by title only. Sure, this is repealing Section 674.02, removal of plants and weeds by owner of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 674.02, removal of plants and weeds by owner. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Patty, would you explain this one? Absolutely. Uh, this is a revision of the um, of the old ordinance. Uh, it <coughs> lifts the mow date, so there is no longer a mow date. There is now a mow height. Um, your grass cannot exceed the nine inches in height. It expands the list of invasive species um, that are included in the ordinance, and they're listed. And I believe that the Environmental Commission is working on some um, educational literature about those plants. It also differentiates between a managed landscape, which does not have to be mowed but needs to be maintained, and a grass lawn, which does need to be mowed. Um, I noticed, because the list has kind of shifted a bit, and, and you know, once I looked at it very carefully, I noticed that there, um, Tree of Heaven, Lesser Celandine, and Japanese Knot Weed are listed under one and under three. And it, it seems that the intent of those two sections is different. So maybe they shouldn't be listed in both sections? I think they need to be listed in both se sections only because those are three of the most incredibly invasive and uh, widespread species. And I think the intent was um, to make it clear that those three species are of particular concern. Um, Which is what one is about. Right. Um, but, they, but they also want them to be included in the full list of invasive species. Right? Okay. Nick, so is then, that your understanding? Because Nick helped us listing, with it a little bit. Well, we're not listing the, the first five there. Um, uh, I, would, I would be inclined to agree with uh, Brian's sentiment. I think. Uh, okay. Uh, Paragraph one or section one kind of trumps. Uh, sorry for that word. Uh, <laughs> section uh, three, uh, and, and if things are included in, in, in that first section, uh, uh, they, they wouldn't need to be uh, really, uh, mentioned. Okay. I mean, we can we can revise it if you want um, to put those three only under section one. Yeah, because the difference, uh, the way I understand it is Section 1 says you must actively destroy these. Correct, section 3 right. is more of a recommendation to manage them. Um, I, th I think it would be good just to be clear mm -hmm. okay. on that. Um, so I would like to make a motion to amend the, the proposed ordinance uh, and take out those repetitions in Section Which was, 3. Which was, what was the, I have. Um, it's the last three. Okay. Um, Tree of Heaven, Lesser Celandine, so FG and weed. H. Yes. yes. Okay. So you want to remove those from the from the second from section from, three. from section three. FG and T. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? So. Second. All those in favor of that change, say aye. 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 So are we passing it? We're just but passing. We're, no, we're, we're passing the just change. that revision, okay. just that change. Anything else? Any other comments from council? 
I'd like to say that um, I'm going to vote against this. I think there's um, the, the thing I'm concerned about uh, is that there are what are amount to small fields that are in the village, um, you know, adjacent to people's homes, could be land that they own, et cetera, that I don't think uh, should have to be mowed necessarily, and I don't think there's any distinctions made in the legislation. Um, and I, in fact, I think it's one of the kind of nice things about the village is kind of has this rural rural aspect uh, to what are like basically meadows that are within the village. Um, so that's my reason for when I vote no. That's my rationale. Um, I, it would be my understanding, and Patty or Nick clarify this. I mean, if, if we're talking about a field that doesn't have grass in it, then it doesn't need to be mowed. As long as well, but these are these are grassy areas. There, you know, um, and I, it's unclear to me what the you know if the neighbor. I understand it will be probably enforced by complaint, uh, but I I just I don't feel like we should mandate that in those instances. Well, if, if you read A, it says the owners of any lot. Or yes. parcel of land yeah. situated it, it within the village, everything. whether it's improved or unimproved, right. vacant or occupied. So, the intent is to to have the to have everything in right. But I, right. but what she was describing to me was a uh, a managed right. Somewhat right. of a well, managed. I'm not talking about a managed. No, uh, you know, managed is more complicated than most of these places are. They're unmanaged and their meadows often. So anyway, I just wanted to explain that. Um, this is the second reading. I will open the public hearing for comment from citizens. Um, three minutes and please come to the, uh, to the microphone and state your name if you have any comments. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Um, are we ready to take a vote, council? Yeah. Okay, Judy, would you please call the vote? Yes. Call the roll. <clears throat> Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. Hemfling. No. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. <coughs> uh, next is emergency ordinance, <coughs> emergency reading of ordinance 2017 10, title only. Okay. This is authorizing the village manager to take all steps necessary to complete the sale of a portion of village-owned property known as Sutton Farm to Glen Helen Association Incorporated and declaring an emergency. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Patty, would you please, um, and I see Nick is here, Nick, so. Nick is here. Um, Nick contacted me <coughs> last week and said, hey, can we close on the sale of Sutton Farm on May the 26th, which we are scheduled to close on May the 26th. However, um, on Nick's end of it, I believe his uh, title attorney would like this resolution passed, just confirming council's willingness to sell the parcels of land to the Glen Helen Institute. And Nick is coming to explain further. Um, hi, Nick Budis, uh, Yellow Springs Citizen, Director of Glen Helen. Uh, our uh, title agent requests that uh, whoever is present for the closing has the authorization to uh, sign documents on behalf of the village, which wasn't something that was uh, addressed in the option. So uh, it doesn't change anything. It just gives Patty or, or whoever you might assign uh, the ability to, uh, to follow through on our previously agreed option. Okay. And just so it's clear that this this uh, ordinance does declare Patty the uh, the agent that will be um, signing on behalf of the village. Um, any comments or questions? This is uh, an emergency reading, so I will open the public hearing for citizen <coughs> comment. Question. Seeing and hearing none, we'll bring it back for a vote. Judy, would you please call the roll? Oh, hey, oh, Karen, Karen, could you ex uh, say how much the village is being paid for the, or uh, Patty? Is it, is it 102, Nick? I have it in my folder, but it's going to take me a minute to find it. Um, I've actually been offering the document. It's closer <laughs> to two than one. Uh, but I, I 200,000, you're saying? Dollars, yeah. Well, if we're going to explain, then did you get a Clean Ohio grant? Is that the? Just for the for the community, just review yeah. 
um, the reason I for this. I bring the original the option thing. agreement today, but uh, it's uh, it was funded through a Clean Ohio Conservation Fund project uh, and was set up such that the uh, uh, village was uh, providing uh, providing match by donating part of the property value as as uh, uh, discovered through the appraisal. And the purpose. The purpose of the acquisition is to uh, to take uh, land that has uh, been used essentially as de facto green space with uh, uh, conventional agricultural on it since uh, since the village acquired it uh, around uh, in the 1960s uh, and establish a more intentional fo form of uh, land stewardship to ensure that uh, it was uh, integrated ecologically into Glen Helen to uh, uh, enhance water quality in Birch Creek, Birch, uh, Creek uh, uh, remove drainage tiles where, where they exist, um, uh, get away from conventional soybean farming, uh, and uh, generally see that those 76 acres uh, uh, become, a, become a meaningful uh, ecological corridor part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, green space of the village has managed uh, to uh, uh, provide the maximum uh, water quality uh, wildlife habitat. And this property, when it was purchased by the village, almost immediately had a, a mm -hmm. agricultural easement put on it. So it's been under, under conservation easement for a long time. The, the, um, uh, village purchased it about 50 years ago. Oh, 50. Uh, and uh, the uh, conservation easement was placed, it was actually the first uh, easement placed by the Tecumseh Land Trust as an organization uh, in the 90s, I believe. Great. And it looks like the village will be getting around $206,000 um, on the sale, uh, from the sale of this property. And, you know, as Nick said, it had been farmed, so it's going to be great for us, you know, to, to reduce the amount of pesticides and to have it revert to a more natural habitat will be good for everyone, I think. So, um, any other comments or questions? Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Humphrey. Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Uh, next, we have resolution 2017-21. We will read that in full. <clears throat> this is authorizing the village manager to enter into an agreement and release with Randall K. Hawley, Jr. Whereas Randall K. Hawley, Jr. Hawley, serves as a police officer for the village, and whereas the village and Hawley agree that it is in the best interest of both parties that Hawley separate from his employment with the village, and whereas the village and Hawley have entered into an employment separation and release agreement, the agreement, and whereas the village manager recommends village council authorize her to enter into an agreement with Hawley for the purpose of terminating his employment with the village, now therefore council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, village council accepts the recommendation of the village manager and hereby authorizes the village manager to enter into the agreement with Holly and to take all actions required thereunder that result in Holly's separation from employment with the village. Section 2, the village manager is hereby authorized to enter into the agreement attached here to as Exhibit A in the same or substantially similar form. Section 3, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Chris, could you... Mm -hmm. Managed to get out of your chair. <laughs> um, his background on uh, what led to this agreement being uh, discussed and uh, talked about was I was contacted by Officer Holly's lawyer to discuss his potential separation from employment from the village, uh, based and primarily it was based upon the events that occurred on New Year's Eve. Um, and there was a mutual recognition that under the circumstances it was in the best interest of uh, all involved, frankly, Officer Holly and the village, that um, he should no longer be uh, employed here. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we uh, talked about uh, the terms and conditions that are reflected in the agreement. Um, and the, the resolution uh, would uh, is a requisite that the council has to do to authorize the village manager to uh, approve and, and sign that agreement so that it would be binding. 
Um, the, the effect of that uh, signature uh, upon approval by council would be that Officer Holly would separate from employment uh, by close of business on May 4th. Thank you. Comments or questions from council? Comments or questions from citizens? Laura Curlis, Village of Yellow Springs. Um, this is a good result. I think people have been waiting for a long time for this. <coughs> there are things in here people won't like, but I think it's the right move. The one thing I would like to see, if you could include it, is an apology from Officer Hawley to the citizens of Yellow Springs. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Any other comments or questions? Are we ready to take a vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And okay. I abstain. Thank you. Uh, uh, staff reports. Um, Patty, we'll start with yours. Um, there is an update on the TLT Community Solutions easement. Uh, Community Solutions closed on the parcels that they bought uh, from the Arnavitz property on Friday, April 28th. And as part of that closing, um, we were able, in conjunction with Tecumseh Land Trust, to um, put a conservation, a conservation easement on approximately 80 acres of the repairing corridor of Jacoby Creek through those parcels. So that uh, is protected. And what does that uh, amount to from the green space? Uh, it was 68,000, I do not have the exact number, 68,200 and something, I believe, uh, was donated, uh, uh, was provided by the village, and the remainder was provided by Tecumseh Land Trust. And can you elaborate a little bit on the Nature Conservancy piece? The Nature Conservancy came out, met with Tecumseh Land Trust, we believe that we may be able to, in the near future, get a grant from the Nature Conservancy that allows us to recoup all of that money. In addition to that, um, they are going to do some restoration work along the corridor as well. Great. So there's an amount. It was sixty-four thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars. Oh. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Just to say that was, uh, the, you know, this we could um, see the preservation of this land. Uh, basically, you know, around, especially around the creek, uh, and we could see all of our green space funds reimbursed. So that right. seems like a real positive. And, and we had pledged two hundred thousand dollars, so um, only a small portion of that's being used. Patty, but it is important to note that the majority of the creek corridor is being protected right. with that. Yes, Marianne. Has that been surveyed? Has it been surveyed? Actually surveyed yet? No. How can we put an easement on it if it's not surveyed? They have drawn it along, according to the geographical lines on the, uh, the um, um, drainage lines, is my understanding. Hmm. I guess I was wondering, because we're, are we still waiting on the survey for the glass farm? We are. We are still waiting on the survey for the glass farm, yes. Hmm. And it's possible that the easement hasn't been put on. The funds were just were were provided provided mm -hmm. in anticipation of the easement being put on and for the sale to go through and to enable community solutions to actually purchase the property. So it's possible that the easement actually hasn't happened yet. But I don't want to. They they've signed a binding agreement. A binding agreement. Okay. Um, as I announced at the last council meeting, um, the um, village is participating uh, in a, uh, not, uh, we have a moratorium on the use of pesticides and we've been working with a group called Beyond Pesticides through the Environmental Commission to find better ways to provide nutrients to our soils. Um, we are doing a test plot at the Gaunt Park. Um, we have moved the test plot and this is what we want people to be aware of this week. We've moved it from part of the uh, ultimate frisbee field over to the left field of the softball diamond. And the reason that we've done that is because that was where the um, samples were actually taken from. Again, I want everyone to be very aware that these are organic nutrients that are being put on the soil. It's things like dried molasses. Um, they are 
perfectly safe for you to walk on as soon as they're put down. Um, I, I don't put chemicals on my own lawn and I would put these on my own lawn. I would play softball on this field as soon as they put this on it. So this is perfectly safe. We will be marking that uh, test area so that you know where it is uh, and you know what's going on and we will keep you informed and hopefully you'll see the results of this new program that we're testing. Um, <coughs> Sutton Farm update we've already talked about. Uh, Dayton Yellow Springs Infrastructure Project, we have received all of the permits, the relevant permits from the EPA. We've talked to Majors Enterprises and we hope that they will begin work again on that project as soon as they finish their um, water line project in Monroe. We hope that to be uh, no later than June 1st that they get started back on that. The water plant continues to progress ahead of schedule. Currently we're about uh, two weeks ahead of schedule and uh, it's a little bit muddy out there right now but hopefully this wind is drying it out a little bit and uh, we'll stay ahead of schedule sounds good um judy well i just got all sentimental about the fabulous people that work here and, and i was commenting that with the windows open i can hear kids playing in the park and playing ball over on the on the uh, basketball area and uh watched uh, one of the streets in and uh, Parks fellas stopped, take time out to free a stuck basketball the other day for a citizen and then play him a little game of one-on-one -on -one before he went back to his mowing. Um, <laughs> there's just a lot of nice interaction that happens. I don't think people, you know, unless you're in the interaction at that moment, you don't tend to see it. And um, I get to kind of a lot, which is very, very nice. And I um, would like to say it's one of the best parts of my job. And I think really is why most folks who work here enjoy working here is being able to do that mm -hmm. as much as we get to do that so that was pretty much it other than that I had to order the bike lights from China which is not a slam on anything except to say that's super far away and they're wending their way here and we very much hope they're here by May 10th but we have a little bit of a backup plan in case they're not here for the uh, bike to school day for for the school kids and they will get here before the end of school Thank you. Judy, and I just wanted to say I appreciated that you also highlighted how important the uh, Bryan Youth Center is mm. for so many of our local youth. And, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> quite honestly, it, truly, I want to give a huge shout out to them. I, I should have. Um, it's where kids go when your parents can't pay for you to go to an after school program. Truly, and they do a great job, and it's, it's every single afternoon those guys are out there making sure kids are. <laughs> all taken care of thanks Melissa welcome back I know you don't thanks. have a report but we're glad to have you back you. yes we are let's <laughs> see you sitting at the table and Chief Carlson I know you were out all week do you have a report you'd like to make well I'll just say what can you just sure. come up and tell them why you were out all week I'm sure you will <laughs> uh, last week Sergeant Watson and myself were out at CIT training the Montgomery County Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services uh, were gracious enough to allow us to join their 40-hour seminar, and it was fantastic. I have to say, some of the best law enforcement training I've ever received. We, it wasn't just classrooms with death by PowerPoint and <laughs> lectures, and we weren't learning how to manipulate someone's arm and how we stand we were learning about how to deal with people with with real mental health issues and substance abuse issues we role play that was fun um, you guys will get a kick out of the fact that during one of the role plays i whipped out my harmonica to, to calm someone and, and they told me they've never seen that before said, yes. um, we spent one day having lunch at the miracle clubhouse in downtown Dayton by UD if you ever have the chance it's open to the public show up at 1130 lunch is 50 cents or a dollar everyone there is been through uh, some type of rehabilitation or has some developmental disabilities and they were some of the most wonderful people I've met they served a fabulous lunch and uh, we just we had a great time we also spent one afternoon uh, assigned individually to a social worker and I happen to uh, be with a wonderful young man who devotes his life to social work because of his brother's situation. And we, we did five uh, of his, we, we visited five of his clients in East Dayton, and it was uh, amazing. 
You have no idea the interaction and the, the, the beautiful things these people bring to uh, the world. So that's pretty much it for my week. It's been a whirlwind. Saturday, Jennifer Berman was kind enough to uh, inter introduce me and allow me to, uh, to speak uh, with a couple of gentlemen about some wonderful things they're doing in Rockford, Illinois regarding uh, the Martin Luther King nonviolence. And uh, forgive me, I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, and it was fantastic, and uh, we saw some interesting photography from around the world. And so uh, I leave tomorrow for South Carolina to for my daughter's graduation, but I promise I'll be back. <laughs> Congratulations on your daughter's graduation, you. and please bring that harmonica to council meetings. <laughs> we may need it sometime. Uh, Okay, now we move on to hearing from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Um, if you do want to speak, we ask that you come up to the microphone and state your name and keep your comments to three minutes. Okay. Hi, I'm Chrissy Cruz. Uh, my citizen concern this evening is that recently I saw on one of the Yellow Springs social media pages something about why does the village of Yellow Springs hate poor people. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's true, but it did bring to mind a couple of things that I've been thinking about. Last year, when it was brought forward that people were <coughs> leaving town without paying their ut final utility bills, and the village was using between fourteen and $15,000 a year from this, village council pretty quickly took action to, first of all, make it so landlords were held responsible for that shortfall and also that letters were sent to landlords when their tenants were in arrears, which I consider public shaming, but apparently um, it was agreed to do that anyways. And at the same time, someone brought an issue to the council about charging an excise tax for rooms in the new hotel. And the, man, the owner of the hotel did not like that idea, and I kind of worked out the numbers, and I realized that the average cost of the hotel rooms, even if all those rooms are only booked on the weekends for a whole year, 3% excise tax would come out to about fourteen to $15,000. So I kind of have to wonder why it was so important to get this fourteen to $15,000 from citizens who are already disadvantaged or they would be paying their utility bills. But it's not that important because to get this excise tax because I was told it would be brought back to the table in April. This is May. Not only was it not brought back to the table, I see it nowhere on this agenda. And particularly, we have invested in that hotel. I asked Patty Bates at the time when I found out that we put in $264,000 worth of infrastructure work to build that hotel. And I asked Patty if that work would have had to be done if it weren't for the hotel. And she told me no. So that means we've invested a quarter of a million dollars in that hotel and asking for them to contribute to the community what most other hotels contribute, which is a 3% tax or so that would be passed on to the consumer. It wouldn't be even be coming out of the hotel owner's pocket. Why we are not going after that money. That is, and I'd also even maybe like to look into, I've seen that excise taxes can be earmarked for specific uses. Maybe we even want to pass an excise tax and also look into what that tax could be earmarked for, something that the village needs that we could use that money. And also I was told that we would be bringing back to the table the issue of sending out the letters to the landlords when tenants are behind, and I don't see that on the agenda either. So those are my citizens' concerns for this evening. Patty, could you please tell us when the um, lodging tax is coming back onto the agenda? Uh, yes, actually, I was just, I actually put a reminder in my calendar for it so that I wouldn't forget it. And it's on the May 22nd, it's uh, actually on my May 22nd calendar to remind me to bring it back and put it on the council agenda this year. For, um, for the June meeting? For the June meeting, yes. I just wanted to add too that I had put on the council goals that we relook at that policy around uh, around utilities and so I'm and I'm supposed to be getting uh, together with staff so I need to get on that I think that's very important that we relook at that uh, policy I do think that it can be um, detrimental to, to uh, tenants who are 
struggling financially uh, to have those letters uh, sent out and and just uh, that there be a better approach I think we should try to come up with a better approach when people are struggling with their utility bills and going back to the hotel tax we did at our council retreat confirm that that was coming back so it should have been on uh, the upcoming agenda items except that we didn't have an agenda planning meeting so right um, we don't because of anything for June yet. right because of the retreat but um, so any other citizens concerns okay um, moving on to our special reports we have uh, design nine here to actually do a final uh, report on the community fiber um, we has got some somewhat of a uh, an interim report about a month ago and now we're we're done and there was a lengthy report. Um, it wasn't in the packet. I think it was probably available online. Actually, it was, it it was, was in the packet. It was in the packet. Okay, good. As well as the and, executive summary. And the executive summary. Yeah. So. Yes, and this is Dr. Andrew Cohill. Okay. Thanks for your time tonight. I, I do have a very brief presentation. Uh, if we just go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, the goals of the study, very quickly, were to uh, do a citizen and business survey to look at the feasibility of doing uh, some kind of fiber initiative in the town and coming up with a set of recommendations um, uh, and build out options and we've, we've done that. Next slide. Um, I talked about the survey results last time so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You can look at the report for more detail. Um, but but it's clear that that there's a majority of both residents and businesses would like to have both both better internet uh, TV and telephone services and more choice of services. Um, I will note that uh, in the comments um, there there was a, a lot of the comments were uh, something to the effect that they weren't sure the village ought to be doing that, and there were questions why the private sector hadn't done it so even though a lot of people uh, feel like things could be better um, not everyone's convinced that that the village government ought to be involved in doing that next next slide so I'm not going to read through this is survey feedback just uh, some of the data again is a, a majority of, of residents are looking for uh, uh, better services next next slide um, so I just wanted a couple of definitions before I go into the options we looked at. We looked at two different kinds of networks, a dark fiber network um, and a lit fiber network. In a dark fiber network, uh, the village would, would install dark fiber on utility poles, meaning there's no elect the village would not buy any electronics. Uh, you would lease out dark fiber pairs to private sector providers who would, who would install their own electronics. Uh, it's somewhat less expensive. Um, it, it, um, and, and so a lit fiber network uh, is both the, the fiber on the utility poles plus the village would buy all of the network electronics on, on each end of the fiber. So it's, it's a more expensive approach. Um, gives the, the revenues a little higher, but the costs are also a little higher. Next slide. So we looked at, at, at four different options very broadly. You can work with existing providers. Um, you have both a telephone and cable TV provider in uh, Yellow Springs. Uh, prices here are reasonably competitive compared to many other areas of the country. Um, the second option is that the village installs a, a dark fiber network and leases that out to one or more service providers. Third option is to uh, the village installs the dark fiber, attaches, buys electronics and attaches it, and actually sells internet service directly as a village utility. And the third op the fourth option, I'm sorry, is a lit network uh, with electronics, but the village leases out capacity to private providers so the village would not be selling any services directly to the public. I, I'll, I know I've kind of run through that. I just stopped for a second and asked if there are any questions about those before I go on. Okay, next, next slide. Um, so there's a couple of business model options we looked at. 
municipal retail, that is, that is where the village would, would actually sell internet service directly to the public in, in competition with the private sector. The, the second option is municipal wholesale, and there's the, that, that would work for both the dark fiber or the lit fiber option. Um, you can lease out, in the lit fiber, you can lease out capacity. Uh, many other communities uh, have taken this approach. Uh, in the dark fiber, you just lease out dark fiber pairs, and, and some communities have done that as well. So we looked at four different cost analyses. Uh, the f two were the full uh, build out of, of putting fiber on all the poles in the, in, in, in the village and passing by uh, all homes and businesses. Um, and two were a much more limited build out. One, just uh, putting uh, dark fiber in a very small area of the downtown, primarily to serve businesses. And uh, the, the, the last option was a variant of that is the, the downtown dark fiber, but extending that into uh, some of the nearby adjacent residential streets. Um, the, there's a number of challenges the village would have if you decide to go forward. I, I talked about the alley clearing issues. Um, we did get a, a cost estimate uh, of about $900,000. Um, the alleys, many of the alleys in town are, are, are uh, very overgrown and, and before fiber, uh, an extensive fiber build could be done, you'd have to clear, uh, do an extensive clearing, um, trimming back trees, trimming shrubbery, um, and I included some pictures. Um, uh, I, I've, I visit a lot of communities in, in more than 20 states. Um, I, I have to say the alleys are pretty bad. Um, and they are going to require some work um, if you wanted to go forward with a fiber initiative. Next slide. Funding is going to be uh, always important. Um, you've got to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, a lot of communities think building the network's the complicated part. That's pretty easy. You can hire a, a competent uh, set of contractors to uh, clear the alleys, put up the fiber, install the electronics. Um, I think the cha one of the challenges for the village would be if you wanted to go forward is to determine how you're going to, to fund the project. Um, you're looking at on the low end of about four or $500,000 for the limited downtown fiber build up to four to five million dollars for a, f a full community build out. Um, there's a variety of funding options. Uh, bonding is certainly an option. Um, given the, that the, the village does not have a track record of doing this kind of utility service offering, um, I would advise that you, you get talk to bond council very early on and get their advice about whether uh, that's, that's uh, really going to, you're going to be able to sell the bonds. Um, it's, the uh, another option that uh, has become more popular is is to actually do the equivalent of a of a pass by and tap fee much the way water and sewer has been financed where you assess each property uh, for a portion of the construction cost to, to fund that um, some communities uh, have done that and spread the the billing the properties out over a period of years so you don't have quite as much uh, the, you, you don't get the full, the, the property owners don't get the full uh, bill in, in year one. Um, you could always raise taxes. That's generally, uh, the very few communities have taken that approach. Uh, next slide. So getting started, um, funding's an issue, uh, alley clearing, um, easements, some of, the, some of the alleys have been abandoned by the village. So in those areas where you needed to get on the poles, put the fiber on the poles, you would have to get easements for property owners. Um, this is generally uh, not too difficult, but it, it can, uh, can, can require some expense. But don't we already have an easement? If the poles are there, how can we not already have an easement? You may not have an easement for telecommunications. You may only have an easement for electric service. Um, it comes up uh, a lot. A lot of utility easements, pole easements were put up 30, 40, 50, 70 years ago. Nobody contemplated uh, fiber. Okay. So things have changed. Um, 
So in, is that a maybe, or we've definitely confirmed that? Um, I can tell you that there are places where we only have electric easements. It specifically says electric. And is that, I mean, is are those, you know, from before when we were abandoning, or like even currently? You, you mean the the alley vacations? Right, because I thought our practice was to make sure we had full access. But now it is. Okay, but it was so this was in the past. Correct. But access isn't necessarily having the easement, but. Right. Okay. Um, mark, market size would be an issue in terms of operations, um, whether you, depending on, and, and uh, the operational costs, of course, would, would vary depending on whether you do a, this, this very limited downtown versus a, a full build out and whether you did municipal retail versus municipal wholesale. But it's a relatively small market. Um, we, we did a number of financial analyses looking at each of the options. And if you did a full build out, um, it looks like it would be very difficult to uh, stay, keep this enterprise in the black if you had less than 50 or 60 percent of the residents taking service. Um, and that, so that may be uh, one of the most important things to consider. I would not go forward with this unless you got binding agreements from at, at, at least uh, a majority of or half the property owners to buy service because you could build it. Uh, a lot of other community networks that um, typically only see in, in, a, in communities where there is competitive telephone and cable service, they might see a take rate of 30 or 40 percent. Um, so the operational costs need to be studied very carefully and you need to make sure you you have a support of the majority of the citizens who are going to be willing to buy this it's not going to be less expensive than uh, what's available now it would probably be about the same price um, it would certainly be a, a higher quality service but it's 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 not going to be a budget service if the village does it there's, there's a certain amount of fixed costs you're going to have that are independent of uh, the the number of subscribers. Yes. Did I see you estimated about seventy five dollars a month? Yes. And that would just be for internet. That's, that's just for internet. Yes. But a lot of people that are are doing cord cutting and getting all of their TV and video services over over the internet. That trend has been accelerating. So the. I wouldn't, if the, if the village decided to go forward, I would not recommend trying to bring in a package of TV. It would be very difficult, A, because of the small market size, but B, there's some expense in, in providing that service and managing it, and I, I wouldn't get involved in that when the market is actually uh, shrinking. Um, the, last, the last thing I would uh, mention is if you go forward, I do think the telephone and cable companies will compete vigorously. We see this in other communities where um, th there is a community uh, effort, uh, a build out. Um, they're they're going to they're gonna fight for market share. Um, they typically are not interested, even if you did the wholesale model, we have rarely seen the incumbents um, agree to lease capacity on the new network usually find we usually find that other other smaller providers in the in the in the area or the region uh, do sign up and agree to use it but um, I, I don't think you could count on spectrum or AT&T agreeing to lease capacity e even though it's actually in their best interest we we just haven't seen it happen yeah I did want to ask about that because um, I know that was on page three in your table um, so the the idea that competitors would vigorously compete is just based on your experience uh, from other situations yes all right because there are situations where the incumbents haven't competed from my understanding well well we've already been contacted by i mean we've we've already had two meetings with spectrum i think spectrum has made it clear that they're going to mm -hmm. compete i don't know i i just i mean but you didn't do any actual interviewing with those incumbents or anything? No, I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it varies from community to community, but we, we generally do see sometimes modest price decreases or uh, improvements in service. Um, perhaps vigorously was too strong a word, but uh, 
I, I would expect them to, if, if you did a full, particularly if you do a full build out, I would expect them to respond in some way. Um, Andrew, when we met with Spectrum, they talked to us about a, a, a low income option that they were going to That's right. hopefully this fall make available to the community um, where you would be able to, at your home if you couldn't afford internet and could show your income level, you would get it for a lesser price. How would that affect, do you think, um, the take rate? Well, I, I, I think it will affect the take rate and, and, and w would have a negative impact. I, I can tell you what we've seen, and we've had the opportunity over the last 20 years to look at a lot of community build outs. Um, res residential buyers of, of telecommunication services are very price sensitive. Um, <clears throat> often it's, you know, even if the, the community uh, offering is is only a few dollars more than the competitive offering Pe people are, are particularly if they're on a fixed budget uh, or, or have uh, uh, lim limited means they're not going to buy the community service even if it's only five or ten dollars more so if there's if if the incumbents are offering uh, low-income families a, a, a discounted rate which is a good thing um, that is going to affect the take rate so could you talk a little bit about this idea of us installing the fiber, the dark fiber option? And um, because you've said that AT&T and Spectrum are not going to put fiber in yellow Springs. Not, not, it's, no, it's not likely. Yeah. It's so, so if our citizens want fiber, if they want higher speeds, some we're going to have to do it. So, um, but you said that the AT&T and Spectrum would likely not collaborate with us what if we went into it with one of them and said we're going to do this to provide higher speed service for our residents and businesses could we potentially do that and then and then how how do we pay for that you know it's it's almost as expensive or is is it's practically the same price because we're installing the same fiber so how exactly do we pay for that I, I'm, I'm not sure. Are you are you saying you would the village would would build the fiber, but then try to partner with right? Um, you, you can always ask them if they'd be interested in that. I mean, I, I've, I've 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 never seen the incumbents agree to partner with a community enterprise. I've never it it's never happened. Can you can you? Possibly reason for that. Um, you know, as I said, it's it's really in their best interest. I mean, you, you take it, you take an incumbent provider who says, you know, we can't make a business case to upgrade to fiber in your community, and the community says we'll build fiber and and let you use it for a reasonable fee. Um, they get to offer improved services to their own customers, and they someone else pays for all the capital costs um, it's a to me it's always been a very compelling business case to partner with the community um, i used to work for at&t once upon a time um, the, the 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 incumbent providers uh, believe that um, they have a certain uh, way of doing business and have have never shown any interest in um, partnering in this way. Have you seen any change now that it's charter now under charter? Um, it, it, just in in their business model. We're we're working in a uh, in Bozeman, Montana, right now. Uh, Bozeman, uh, the the community built formed nonprofit, built the network, charters, the cable provider, and we've talked to them many times. Um, they've never shown any interest in it. Um, they should because there's there's five providers on the Bozeman community network and they're they're taking charter business customers away every day. Can you give us a little bit of a reality check on the service we do have? I mean, clearly the the survey came out very strongly supporting community fiber, but could could you kind of compare where we are and what we have now, what our service is now, with maybe what some of the other communities that have done 
community fi or have done municipal fiber, why they've done it, and what our situation is comparatively? Um, sure. Um, m most communities that do it uh, do it primarily for economic development reasons, n not not for residential demand. Um, that's not always the case, but but I would say a majority of community projects uh, have have a, a goal of either uh, retaining existing businesses that have said, if you can't improve internet service here, we're going to have to pick up our jobs and move, or they feel like they're losing uh, business and jobs to other communities that that have better, more competitive. Uh, pricing and, and, and internet and, and data options. Um, there have been, uh, the, one of the projects that we've, we've worked with for a number of years is in uh, rural New Hampshire. Uh, it was about 20 towns that actually got a federal stimulus grant back in 2011. Um, and that, that was driven primarily by residential needs. Um, the difference between there and here is that in, in most of, it was about a quarter of the state, uh, most of those very small communities had no cable service at all. They had very, very poor DSL, maybe some of the worst DSL in the country. And so um, th there was a, a, a lot of motivation to I improve uh, particularly internet access because there was no cable option. Um, the, the, there's, in, in terms of price, uh, the prices here, particularly for cable, are not bad. They're a little below the national <coughs> average, um, and the service the service is about equivalent to uh, what we see in other communities. Any other questions from council before we open it up to the community? Um, I wanted to clarify. Uh, when I read about the uh, limited build out focused on the downtown, two questions. There was a number in the uh, executive summary that looks like it's a mistake. It said um, might start at, it reads 1,275,000, but was that just supposed to be 275,000? Uh, it, it may be. It's, okay. That does sound like a typo. All right, it looks like a typo. And then um, I, I was also curious about um, why you only focused on dark fiber for the limited build out and not lit fiber. Uh, it, it's really an issue of capacity for village staff. Um, th there's a lot more day-to-day uh, -day management involved. If you e even have a small amount of electronics, you could certainly um, outsource some of that, but the, the, the initial cost is going to be higher and the ongoing responsibilities are going to be more significant. Um, I, I'd be happy to look at that, but I, 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 it, it's a very small market f for the downtown businesses. Mm -hmm. We have found generally that, that smaller uh, retailers are also very price sensitive and um, w whether it's lit or dark I, I think even the downtown you'd, you'd want to do you'd want to have a conversation with with and, and and be reasonably confident that a majority of the business owners are, are willing to say yes if you build this I am going to buy services off this network whether it's lit or dark <laughs> I do have a question. Um, when you're looking to the fu into the future, um, is it predicting how this how the service will evolve? Um, if if we did our own system, which sounds pretty expensive to me, um, is there a chance that we would be outdated? in the not too distant future in some way that it would be no the good, the good thing about fiber is it's it, it really future proofs you it's it's got a a, a service life of a minimum of, of, of now about 40 years uh, if it's well maintained it's going to last longer than that if there's fiber that the telephone companies installed in the 70s and early 80s it's still in service and working um, you know, it's it, it sounds expensive. It, it depends on how you how you spread out the money. Um, if if you could collect um, 
a, a dollar a day from, from every citizen for a few years, um, you, you could pay for the whole system. So it's really about financing. That's why I say the funding part is the bigger challenge in figuring out how to come up with it. I mean, compared to water and sewer, it's a bargain. Um, you know, I, people say, well, isn't putting fiber on poles or putting fiber in the ground difficult? And it's like, no, what's difficult is, is putting in sewer, uh, you, you know, digging 10 foot deep holes that are four feet wide in limestone um, to get sewage to run downhill. That's difficult. Um, so, I, I, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible to do something good here, um, but you're going to have to think about it very carefully. And, and the, the the alley clearing, I mean, if, 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 you, if the community's willing to go forward and do that, and it is, I think, to me, partly a public safety issue that needs to be done anyway, um, it, it's just a matter of hiring someone to do it. The, the finance is the most important part, so you've got to know how you're going to pay for it and make sure that you're going to have enough customers to operate it in the black. Those, so the, it comes down to those two things. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, do you have any opinion on urgency based on federal policy and what's happening right now? It, it's strictly my opinion. I have no special channel to Washington, but I would I would not expect that you're going to see much money coming from Washington for fiber or or broadband initiatives. And what about in terms of shutting it down? Shutting, uh, preventing communities from moving forward with these kind of projects. Um, that that's I, I don't think that's going to happen, but you know there's there's I, I we've never regarded that as a particular problem because uh, you you could if you wanted to do this you could form a community nonprofit, and uh, the the funding becomes a little more challenging, um, but uh, there's there's plenty of ways to get around any. Legislative uh, initiatives in Ohio. I mean, there's a lot of communities that are already doing this in Ohio. I would be surprised. Again, it's just my opinion. I would be surprised in Ohio that if you saw a state-led initiative to uh, limit the ability of of localities to do it, because there's just there's Ohio is really a leader in the nation in in terms of of community initiatives. Where, where in Ohio? Is it happening? Uh, Columbus, uh, Hudson. Um, yeah, there's 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 at least a half a dozen uh, communities that um, are, are doing this. When we started looking into it, my sense of the cost, both the build-out cost, but especially the monthly cost, was considerably lower than what you're telling us. So it's disappointing. Um, if you look around the country, whether it's a community initiative or it's a private sector initiative, um, you're not going to see uh, anything below 65 or 70 dollars for fiber internet, and in many places, it's it's more like 90 to 100 dollars. It's it's a premium it's a premium service. So what's, uh, what's now, now having oh, said that, I mean, the thing to remember is a lot of people are cutting the, the cord on their cable. So in fact, if you put in a premium fiber service and people feel more comfortable getting rid of their cable TV, they might, and, and this is part of the case of make, making the case to citizens and, and convincing them that this is worth doing, is you, you have to do the math for them and say, look, yes, this may, you may be paying $45 a month for internet right now, and yes, it may be 75, but you will have the option of, of here's all the, the TV programming that you're paying 65, 75, $85 a month for, you can now get for 20 or $30 <coughs> a month over the internet. So there's, there's a net savings involved in doing it. But you can get that anyway. I mean, I'm just getting internet. I don't have cable, and I'm, I could get the Netflix. I mean, I do get Netflix. Sure, and that's that's absolutely true. Which is which is one of the problems. Um, it's 
you, you have to compete against the private sector. It's, it's one of the issues very broadly with, with, with community initiatives like this. It's not like water or sewer where you, you, the, the, the municipality has a natural monopoly and everybody you know, everybody that wants to flush their toilet is going to buy sewer service from you. Um, you can't make people take a telecommunication service. And that's why a lot of communities only get a 30 or 40 percent take rate. And it's been higher. Um, some communities have done, have, have done much better than that. It's, it's, it's often in communities where there's uh, no cable service or very poor cable service. I'd like to suggest that we maybe go another 10 or 15 minutes on this and then move on because we've got a lot on our agenda. We have a lot in our agenda, yeah. but this and is this, an important... This is, this it is, is and, just, and we've got, I think we need to hear from our fiber. Yeah. Yeah, so, I too, but so I just wanted to put a lot to put this. a time frame on um, it so that... Yeah, let's, I mean, let's try to be done by quarter till. Yeah, thank you. Um, folks, I'm going to, I'm looking to the fiber group, SpringsNet. Um, I assume you guys want to have something to say. You're eating up valuable time, guys. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm Matt Cole. I'm the, you know, remember me as the financial guy making that presentation about how long ago? Um, so I did, you know, most of the numbers with my friends um, uh, Saturday mornings for about a year and a half. And I just want to, in a shotgun blast kind of way, I made a couple of notes, and then I'll, I'll move on and give some time to them. Uh, the first thing um, I, I noticed just listening to Mr. Colehill is that, you know, there's a lot of comparison with other communities, and I'm, um, honestly, I don't think that he, maybe he really completely understands us. Everybody that I talk to would rather put a fork in their eye than call Time Warner customer service. I think there's a big local... Uh, push here, you know, and a, and a willingness to pay for something that everyone needs, but see the money go to our local government as opposed to Time Warner or someone else. Um, one of the key points of the uh, financial model was that um, we have some good idea about take rates because people would sign up beforehand. Uh, we, my plan we had like okay three months up, up front and with that kind of thing rolling for a few months before anything really took off um, you know maybe we could get a 40 percent take rate before even the dollar was spent on constructing the thing it would also support um, or or help out a, a bond initiative um, other people or investors would be happy to buy the bond if they already knew that 40 percent of the village had prepaid for a service they may not get for a year um, I, I think that any obstacles that come along, like the trees and other things, there are solutions for those. And I think that with a project this size, there has to be mass coordination and uh, communication and overcoming lots of these little obstacles. Um, I think, uh, let's see, there was a comment here, same price, higher quality is the only reason many of the people in the village uh, need to unplug their cable and buy a local internet service. Um, I think that any competitors or you know any price dropping that would just help the village, anybody that can't afford what we thought would be forty dollars a month with minimal increases over a twenty year period of time, um, um, that would just benefit uh, uh, any anybody that wasn't making enough money to pay for that forty dollars. So I think it'd be great to see uh, Spectrum start charging $30 to compete with our $40 price or $45 price. Um, I'm going to call time out there and just hand it over to Scott. All right. Uh, I think I can do this in three minutes. Um, my name is Scott Fife, a village resident, member of the SpringsNet committee, and. I am not speaking on behalf of SpringsNet tonight because I, we've not had a chance to meet and I wouldn't presume to do that without a chance to, to collaborate with my colleagues. Um, and, and Dr. Cohill is absolutely right. Careful thought absolutely would have to go into an, an initiative like this. We fully understand that. Uh, I would like to just say on our behalf that 
uh, we literally spent hundreds and hundreds of person hours uh, in this endeavor for almost two years prior to, to endeavor in undertaking this survey. Um, with that said, I, I would like to reserve the right to perhaps come back to council in, at a future time after we've had a chance to meet and, and offer some thoughts on this again. I would like to say uh, just a couple of things tonight. Um, and I, I believe there are six thoughts I would just like to ask the community to keep in mind as we proceed about this. And I'd like to begin with a, a, a quote. Um, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> I had it right here. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm reading from the, uh, uh, today we estimate that nearly $4 million per year is put in envelopes by residents and businesses in the town for telecom services and mailed out of Yellow Springs and out of the state. And over, over a 30 year period, uh, the estimate is that $114 million leaves the village to go to AT&T, Time Warner, Earthlink, and other providers of telecom services. Um, that information came from uh, the response of Design 9 to our, 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 our RFP for this, this study. So that's the source of that information. Uh, and that would be my first thought that I'd offer that we keep in mind, that $114 million is quite a chunk of money for a village of 3,500 people. Um, and I would suggest that that's plenty of reason to, to look very hard at this. Uh, a couple of other things. We uh, all know there's been a lot of talk lately about the cost of living in Yellow Springs, affordability of things. Uh, we believe that with all of the rising costs of other utilities, this would give the village a chance for a win, a chance to offset some of those, those other projects. Um, Economic development is, of course, a, of keen interest to many of us, and we're all interested in clean and, and environmentally responsible economic development. High-speed internet service is all about that kind of thing. Um, finally, last last couple points I'd make. Um, I have no monopoly on this information, but I believe, I, I ask myself frequently, why is Yellow Springs an electric utility? Uh, I don't know another town around here of, of this size that's their own electric utility, but I believe I have an answer, and, and in large part I got it from Johnny Burns after the last meeting, where he told me that 93% of our electricity is created from non-renewable sources. Um, nobody else can say that, and, and that to me, from renewable, renewable. Uh, I'm sorry, from <laughs> renewable sources, <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, that's that's tremendous and to me that justifies all whatever kinds of hassles come along with that being able to do that why are we our own water utility well i tried to follow the debate about the water situation closely and i know that a lot of thought and a lot of uh points were made about the quality of our water and how we didn't want to have to take somebody else's water that might have chemicals coming into the, the watershed uh, I value those kinds of things as a citizen, and I appreciate the work that council and the community has done about that. With all the talk of net neutrality and the internet service providers selling your browser history to, to whomever they want, um, the current political climate, I think, would give us a, a perfect reason to, to consider being our own internet service provider, as we would be in charge of that kind of thing. And I believe that that kind of control over our own destiny is what, is, is what makes this such a great place to live. So those are six thoughts I would just like to, to ask people to keep in mind as we proceed with this debate. And um, I, I, I trust council will be receptive to perhaps hearing some more from us. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? I'll be very, very brief. I am uh, Thor Sage. Um, I think that the, that the uh, work that Dr. Cohill has done does require a, a bit more uh, discussion. And we, we I, I know the SpringsNet group have, have a lot of questions for Dr. Cohill that we may not have had, not had an opportunity to ask. Um, a couple of notes. Uh, I don't know that the fiber project should take the full brunt of all the tree trimming challenges that the village has. Uh, this, is, this is an issue that has to be addressed regardless of whether or not a fiber project goes forward. Um, the cost for, uh, for a fiber-based uh, utility service in communities that we looked at, even at our own fiber forum, uh, back two years ago, April, we talked, we, one of our guests was uh, from Sandy, Oregon, who was offering, uh, what was it, 100 meg service at $39. 
uh, fiber-based service. So um, there's there's a there's a great deal uh, there are a great number of examples of uh, of uh, very affordable fiber-based service uh, when uh, municipalities uh, take the initiative. Um, the, I don't understand the, the, the cost per household. Um, we, as this, the SpringsNet group, put together, uh, or we were able to research and you know, discover that the average cost per fiber to the home uh, implementations is somewhere between thirteen and eighteen hundred dollars a home. But everything I'm seeing in this current report indicates that we're looking at somewhere between twenty-one and twenty-six. And I and I'd have to do a lot more math in order to um, get to that. Um, and uh, I, I would ask if we've talked to you know uh, if we've talked to any fiber to the home vendors. Um, there are they do exist. There's a, a company called ACDNet that's operating out of Lansing, Michigan, and Dublin, Ohio, that specializes in fiber to the home service. Uh, that might be a good partner for a project like this. And I want everybody to know that the village of Cedarville is looking at fiber to the home. Um, they're uh, actually they've actually gone so far as to establish a co-op. Uh, and that's going to be their model is to run it through a co-op. But uh, there's there's a lot of activity in the region that, and possible partners. So that's all I have. Thank you. And Cedarville has a university that's doing, that's helping to supplement what's happening in Cedarville. Uh, I, I, Cedarville University. Yes. Dan. Um, I'm a member of SpringsNet, but I'm saying this all on the cuff. We haven't had a meeting, so I'm it's not a, these are my own opinions I appreciate dr. Cole's uh, study uh, is very interesting except I think there's a certain um, when he says internet fiber internet service versus what um, um, Marianne thinks is her DSL service as being quick equal you know if you get it from AT&T or Time Warner or Spectrum versus getting fiber there's a qualitative difference between the two in terms of speed and reliability upload and download much more for the business and being a single I you know let's say only one person in the home maybe DSL works fine but when you have a, a modern family with a lot of IP uh, internet devices I don't think it does it cuts very well and um, so let me ask you council how many we, we, I see on my utility bill trash service how many people in, does the village employ for trash services Dan, you don't. Don't. Can, yeah. okay can you kind so of you summarize so pardon me it just summarize I mean I, I don't know that we have time to be well, answering the point your is, questions um, dr. Colo was talking about village staffing for um, internet fiber service we wouldn't really have it any different than we would for trash we contract it out have it taken care of that way uh, I don't think there's you know the potential that there's a need maybe for more contract administration but that's what I was I you know I think these little fine details need to be further threshed out thank you for your time thanks any Dan. questions for me well I'm assuming that we're going we're not dropping this discussion right thank now you. look forward to hearing more from Springsnet. Great. that's great Tim Barhorst uh, I'll keep this real short I just want to suggest that we reconvene the managers advisory board and uh, discuss the presentation in detail mm -hmm. and uh, come up with some recommendations for council that way I would I would say that that makes sense I mean we mm -hmm. we did a step of we've invested how much in this study forty eight thousand dollars in the study so um, mm -hmm. I mean we certainly aren't going to just drop it um, but we have to have a thoughtful approach for for how we're going to go to the next step yeah I like I think that has that advisory committee been on hold or well yes we were waiting for the report which okay. I got last week and released actually they got it yeah. just prior to the public getting it after they got it just yeah. shortly after council um, um, there's at least two things that I want to make sure are addressed. I mean, I have many others, uh, and I think the uh, advisory board will bring that up. Well, one thing is Thor mentioned it, and I, I remember Dan had also talked about um, closely evaluating what the alley clearing piece is all about, um, because that is almost a million, um, you know, at least in, in these projections from this report. And uh, I think some good issues have been brought up about that. 
And I also want to understand better what this easement issue is, because it, it sounds like a big deal from the report, um, and I, I want to understand really what the implications are, if that is true. Um, and I just want to make sure we have a policy in place that we will always, when we abandon, get an easement on telecommunications, right? I mean, yeah, we, okay. if there's a if there's a pole in there, if it doesn't have an existing easement, we can certainly make sure that happens. Okay. Uh, because Johnny and his crew need access to it anyway. All right. Um, but um, I'd like to address a couple of things just real quick. Go ahead. Um, first of all, um, Scott, you made a, a, a comment about um, the uh, profit from from a fiber network potentially being $114 million a year. I'd just like to point out that if this is run as a utility, any profit from that goes back into the utility. It does not go into the, um, it does not go into the general fund, and I don't want people to have that misconception, because if it's run as a utility, it's very specific that enterprise fund profits only go back into the enterprise fund. Um, and as in relation to the tree trimming, uh, along the alleyways, would it be done anyway? Yes, but at a much substantially slower rate because Johnny would add it on to his annual $100,000 a year try to catch this kind of thing up type of thing. So um, I just wanted to cover those two things really quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess, you know, the one thing I would like, I would really like you guys to concentrate on, the fiber committee to concentrate on, is is the economics is is this initial startup cost how do we pay for it how do we fund it initially and i would agree that we could potentially get a 50 to 60 percent take rate but but we're also talking about asking people to potentially come up with fifteen hundred dollars out of pocket eighteen hundred seven hundred and fifty out of pocket i mean how does that initial um how does that initial um installation happen um, so, it, you know, explain that to, ex, you know, help us understand that um, and um, how those finances kind of continue out over, you know, a five to ten year cycle. Um, anything else? Well, I did want to say, I noticed related to that, that the best uh, ROI was on a lit fiber municipal build out um, from this report. And that was in year five. So I think that's an interesting thing to tease out. I just wanted to say, I, I thought the presentation was very clear. Um, and I know people want to analyze it and you know look at the numbers carefully and so on. But I appreciate, uh, I forget your name. <laughs> Mr. Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, uh, just the clarity with which you presented your material. OK, thank you so much, thank Andrew. You. Okay, what are we moving on to? Where's my agenda? Um, discussion regarding U.S. bank accounts. Um, there was a letter I had received. Actually, it was on my table at the last meeting, um, but I had just received it. I just opened it from U.S. bank that made it into the packet explaining their policy um, about investments. Um, they did... Um, they did not provide, a, they, they are quick to say that they did not provide project financing for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, they do have one, a relationship with one of the companies involved in the project. Um, and that on the back they had information about how, how their investments um, are socially sustainable, do, do support socially sustainable or sustainable businesses, economic sustainable business practices. and environmentally sustainable business practices. So, um, Marianne, I know that you, um, in addition to this letter, you did ask, I think, for this to be brought back as a discussion item um, at the last meeting. I, did, did, did we talk about it at the last meeting? No, we didn't at all. No. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, the, originally citizens, a number of citizens, came to council uh, requesting that the village withdraw its funds from U.S. Bank. Close the door. You no, you can't close the door, but you can ask them to talk more quietly. Um, because we were told that they were a primary funder of the uh, Dakota, North Dakota 
uh, pipeline. And um, when we, so, so we did write a letter to U.S. Bank stating that this was a concern. We sent it to the CEO and the Ohio district manager and, and the local branch manager. So the letter that we received is in reference to that indicating that they are not a funder of that pipeline project. Um, but, but what we also found out was that, one, um, probably all banks are funding these kind of things. For example, West Banco is funding fracking, which would be a logical uh, bank for us to go to, but that is no better. And they're doing it in this area, too. Um, the credit, the credit unions not, doesn't have the capacity to handle our funds. Um, in U.S. Bank's favor, it is a local, I mean, it's not a local corporation, but it does have a local presence in Yellow Springs. And staff, it's very easy for staff to go there and use it. So I had uh, sent an email out to the people who had uh, requested that we uh, remove our funds from U.S. Bank explaining what the issue was and asking for any suggestions, and I got none. Um, so f in terms of that reason, I, at this point, myself, personally, I don't uh, see us removing our funds from U.S. Bank. Right, and I think we had had our, we had asked our treasurer um, and finance director, although since Melissa was on leave, I, it looks like she has a whole pile of stuff. So, I mean, can you briefly address what? Yeah, I, I had uh, printed out a few extra of these for um, anybody in the audience that might um, want to take a look. Um, it's just a, it's a brief four-page document that actually um, the credit goes to Rachel McKinley. Um, since I was off, um, this wasn't something that I had the time to be able to do, and I knew that um, the community and the council were, were interested in uh, um, some, in, some more information. And so Rachel was kind enough to do some research for me. Um, so basically what she did was she took a look at the three banks that were um, in town. There's West Bank, U.S. Bank, and then the credit union. And she uh, got some information off of a website called banklocal.info. And it kind of um, compared a number of different um, items, um, including local impact, small business lending, their ownership, their size, where they're headquartered out of. Um, she also uh, took a look at connections to the fossil fuel industry. Um, she, she also has some, some data in that regard. And in her conclusion, um, U.S. Bank really did make the most sense. Um, West Banco had a higher concentration of loans within the energy sector. Um, Huntington Bank, she also looked at, which wasn't in Yellow Springs, um, and we do use them for investments, which she um, she proposed that we keep our investments separate from our general banking. So Huntington was out, and as Marianne indicated, the credit union can't handle um, the capacity that we would need them to. Um, U.S. Bank provides us with a number of services like lockbox payments. Um, there's an whenever you mail in your utility bill, if you actually look at the address, it goes to Cincinnati, and that's a lockbox and they process all of those payments for us and it's it's a lot of payments um, on a daily basis and it it relieves our staff of having to do that manually um, so um, for example the credit union doesn't offer lockbox payments so that would make us increase our staff if we had to go with a bank that didn't offer a service like that um, which wouldn't make financial sense at the end of the day so um, basically all in all based on Rachel's um, research, it, it still makes sense to remain with U.S. Bank. The question, one question I have is for the people who, you know, were really advocating this, and uh, I know they referenced other communities that had decided to move their monies, and I was curious, you know, where they moved their monies to and how they made that decision, so I wondered if maybe they could get us that information. I would be interested in that. I do know that larger communities might have more banking options that would be local. One of my main concerns is 
um, any of our staff, um, myself or no, either the two clerks. Yeah, no, I, pre I appreciate money. that issue as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I also was curious because, you know, uh, I just was curious, you know, how they came to their decision and what they found out about the decision they made, where they mm -hmm. moved it, just, just to understand, you know, how they were weighing, uh, or if there's some, you know, it would just be interesting to know that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think bottom line, I think for citizens who are concerned, I feel like we, we heard them, we responded, mm -hmm. and we were making a, um, a, a, an educated decision to um, stick with U.S. Bank at this point. Um, yeah, unless they have more information right. that, would give, that would give us some way, direction to go that would make some sense, you know. That's... Well, as I said, I did send an email yeah. out to probably about 20 people mm -hmm. and um, asking for more information yeah, and so didn't hear any. Yeah. And I've talked to MJ, who's uh -huh. really leading this. And you said they, they've seen this response from U.S. Bank? No. Okay. No, they haven't seen that. So maybe we should try to... Well, because I'm curious, you know, related to that, what is the the other side because mm -hmm. there seemed yep. to be some pretty strong conviction um, so. but I it, w it was on the agenda we announced it was going to be on the agenda the agenda was published I mean I, I I know it's tough for people but I think it is a it is an item that we've been discussing for about um, at almost every meeting at least it's been mentioned and um, citizens who are very concerned about it probably have had an opportunity um, they, and they had an opportunity to see this letter in the packet, so um, hopefully they they have seen it. And, you know, we're not sh we're not we're making a decision right now that uh, um, we're not going to make any changes. That doesn't mean that we won't continue to hear information that people might bring to us. Um, next item on the agenda is the draft police chief job description. Um, the end of last meeting or during, at the last meeting, that's one of the items that we asked um, a village manager to prepare. It actually had been prepared. She worked with uh, uh, Pat Dweez and, and Janet Mueller to draft this. So we'll turn it over to her to uh, review what she's come up with. Um, as you can see, the, the primary job description is, is fairly lengthy. I, we put quite a bit of time into this, Pat, Janet, and myself. Um, in addition to that, I've included this summary um, job description in there. Um, the reason being that normally you advertise a shorter job description that provides a link to the more extensive and detailed job description. Um, now, that said, the, the summary job description is also kind of lengthy because we felt that there were some very important things that needed to be included in that summary job description. Um, but we were very careful to include um, the, the inclusiveness summary. that we felt was very important in Yellow Springs for all communities, um, uh, particularly the um, uh, LTGBQ community. Um, and we also included the citizen involvement that we felt was important. Um, the cultural values of Yellow Springs we tried to incorporate into that. Um, and we brought in the thoughts from both the Justice System Task Force and the input that they've gotten from the citizens as well as the 365 group and the input that they've gotten from the citizens. And we tried to put all of that together um, into a pretty inclusive job description, and that's what you have in front of me. Um, I, well, first of all, thank you for everyone who worked on this. I think they're very well written. Very mm -hmm. good. Um, I, I have a few questions and suggestions, but I was really pleased to see them. Mm -hmm. um, one question I have is, what is the profile and challenge statement? I didn't see it. Is it a separate document? Uh, I don't remember that part, Pat. Do you remember? <laughs> I was thinking it had to do with the vision statement when I read it, but, uh, which now is being worked on. Oh, I see it. I see it at the top. You know what? Uh, I apologize because that is probably left over from 
part of this job description came from the job description that was prepared when I was hired. Oh. And that is probably left over from that, and we did not catch it. So thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's mentioned in both of those documents. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the uh, one fleet management management property position as part of the police department? Um, that is, it. do you know Ken Metz? Uh, Ken handles the fleet management, which is all of the vehicles, making sure they're serviced properly, that the, the vehicles are in good shape and able to run. He also manages the property room, which is um, the found property or the recovered property um, from, you know, things that have been stolen that are recovered and by the And that's a full-time position? Uh, no, it's a part-time position. Oh, okay. Um, I did think maybe in the uh, application part that we might mention that the population, that we are a tourist town, you know, so that in the summer and especially on weekends, the population okay. increases. I mean, I the number of people here. I would prefer the words destination. Wh whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. And maybe also mentioning that we are responsible for patrolling Glen Helen. There were a couple typo things yeah. where it says city police I got needs this. to be changed to village. But basically, I thought I thought it was really well done. Yeah. Okay. It, I mean, the only other thing I noticed is is the ideal can. It's it, it may be in more places, but I noticed it especially in the ideal candidate section is that there seems to be going back and forth between using the term local policing and community policing. Oh, we and, all of those. and that happened, I mean, that's happening with the statement, the vision statement, and maybe we need to decide right, it's what we want those words to be. Either local or village. Um, yeah, we we've thought, moved away from community. Yeah, we thought we had caught all of those because they, they did say community policing previously, and we thought we had caught all okay. of them. I also wanted to say I thought it was it's a very well done document and uh, I thought you guys did a great job sort of capturing the the uh, what the village is about and what it is we're looking for so I thought it was very good um, so I also appreciate the the work that's been done I, I have a couple different recommendations I think the references to the local policing, village policing standards and vision are great. Um, but I guess I'd love to see concrete references in the job description rather than directing people to another document. I mean, we've got so much powerful language that was worked on. Um, I think that that could uh, really flesh this out in a way that uh, makes it uh, more clear what is different about being the chief in Yellow Springs. Um, and then I thought about some specific examples. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the importance of things like CIT training, implicit bias. Those sorts of things could be referenced directly in this job description. Um, and I guess I'd also like to see uh, a, a stronger statement um, about things like a, a LGBT and, and that sort of thing, um, just to really drive home, you know, what our village values are. Um, so I, I think everything's good, but I would just like to see that stuff in the job description itself. Um, and I, I think we already have that language. Um, so do you want to do some editing? I usually get to, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes to expect somebody else to That's, jump into I, what... I'm not... Ex anytime I make a comment, I'm willing to do the work. So <laughs> I've always shown that. Would you prefer that or have at it? <laughs> <laughs> Brian? Yeah. You're, 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 you're better at putting in what you're talking about than me trying to do it and going back and forth with you. It's quite the time saver. So. How does citizen citizen comment on the just on the on the chief description job description? Okay, um, are we ready to move on to the next item, which is the um, uh, draft hiring process that we also asked Patty to put together? Yep, I am. 
So, um, I mean, I think we really kind of left the last meeting with the option of two, two or three potential processes, um, one being a full external search, uh, which is something that um, was talked about as of January 3rd as being um, important to the community. Um, there's been a lot of support for the current chief, and so there was some discussion of um, uh, having just a, doing an internal posting, foregoing an external process, doing an internal posting. Um, so this particular process that Patty prepared would be the full-blown search um, for external candidates and internal candidates. <coughs> Well, I for one, I you know, I I read that over, and and I am still of the opinion and, and and of the feeling that we we should just conduct an internal search, uh, and and do that as quickly as possible. Uh, again, I think we we uh, you know, given uh, the uh, fact that we have resolved a lot of issues that have taken place since uh, New Year's Eve uh, and I think folks have stood up uh, that that were involved and uh, did what we thought was the right thing and and now I think it's time for us to move forward so that's why I'm saying that uh, I would just like to see a an, an internal search and uh, have Patty come up with a with a timeline on how she think that could happen and so forth. I think we may be able to come up with that. Yeah. If, if all of council is in agreement or has other comments to make, I think maybe we could come up with that. And if, if um, speed is desired, we probably need to come up with a timeline maybe while we sit here. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to speak to this. Um, if the rest of council wanted to do a full search, I would support that. Um, I, there are risks regard, regardless of what path we take, there are risks. And some of those risks, we don't even know what they are. Um, I think a value of doing a full search is that it's as comprehensive process as we could have. And, it, and while I would imagine that uh, we will end up with a local candidate. It does give us, um, if nothing else, uh, the opportunity to compare who, people we have locally to people who aren't local. Um, at the same time, as we've talked about this, um, it's clear that we've had non-local people uh, for a, a couple decades and have done broader searches and none of them have been success none of them have resulted in a candidate who was who worked um, and e e someone might look good on paper and someone might look good in person as a potential candidate but you never know if you don't know someone really you never know how they're gonna work out so I mean I see things both ways but um, my sense is that probably we'll end up just going local. Um, I guess I, w I also want to support a um, just an internal uh, search. I think um, by our uh, employee uh, manual, which I understand is a little bit uh, confused, and I think we need to clarify the language. I think it's best pa practice that when you are doing a hiring, that you, at a minimum, do an internal search. I think we should clarify that language so that's very clear. That is what we intend to do every time, is to post internally and um, that we, that we uh, do an internal search. Yeah. Yeah, and just to uh, you know, extend that, I would like to make sure that we fix that language uh, ASAP. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, I think there, you know, if we focus on what the intent of the personnel manual it is, um, I think I would agree that it is that at a minimum we post jobs internally and we've all spoken to it being a best practice. Um, I had another thought, but I'm not 
sure what it was right now. <laughs> well, I, I'm definitely in. Oh, I know what oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, um, I just want to make sure that in this process, well, I, I guess one thing that seems pretty clear to me is is a general consensus among the community that we want someone local. Um, so I think that also validates uh, this decision. Um, but in particular, I want to make sure that the process that we do have uh, maximizes the ability for citizens to provide input, ask questions of the candidates, and, and that sort of thing. So that, that would be my recommendation. So um, I'm agreeing with everything that's been said. Um, I would like um, to, to, min up, to post um, for internal candidates. Um, and I would actually like this to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, I would like if, say, by June 5th, um, if we could possibly have this decision made and have legislation by June 5th. Um, so that would mean um, uh, that would mean we've got a busy month of May. Um, Patty, do you have some, um, I mean, how quickly can you? Uh, I can post tomorrow, but uh, depending on how much wordsmithing Are Brian you, wants to do with do, do we need to wordsmith the job description? Okay. Well, I can, I can. Yeah, my understanding about the job description is that, I mean, it's important to formalize what our chief in Yellow Springs is all about. So. Yeah, I can, I can take the job description um, tomorrow and, and, you know, take out the, the typos about the profile and challenge statement and make sure it says local policing um, and village. I can get that posted, and uh, then I would say if you post tomorrow, you need to leave it for a week um, at least. I think the manual says two days, but um, I don't like that number. I don't think it's fair because the officers rotate shifts. Um, so I would like to leave it until, um, uh, if I post tomorrow, May the 10th perhaps, and then have a review of the applications. Um, we could do uh, interviews uh, the week of the 16th. I think we need to we need to talk about the process. If we're going to post only internally, what do we want the process to be? Because that's going to determine the rest of the timeline after that. Um, one thing that I think Judith had mentioned um, at one point was uh, a process that they had used previously, um, where citizens, uh, each council person chose a citizen to be part of the interview process. Um, I think that it's important that the public have the right to ask um, questions of the candidates in a public forum, um, perhaps a meet and greet section like we had uh, the last time, um, input from council on this. That's well, what I'd like, well go ahead. You know, I, was, um, <clears throat> I like the way we, we did yours. <laughs> Because uh, I was on it. But, you know. I'm assuming you uh, don't want to take the full two days, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, but, but anyway, <clears throat> I'd like to, to, to kind of facilitate both. I'd like to, to suggest that we, you know, after we get the uh, applications uh, in, uh, from uh, prospective uh, individuals, that we have a community get a chance to greet the the applicants, to to interview them uh, in an open forum, uh, whereby uh, they just throw questions out to them. Okay. Uh, with mediators. With with a mediator. <laughs> to control it so that so that uh, the community would get a chance to kind of see how our chief would respond to open questions uh, have a time period for council for council to to uh, interview the folks uh, the, the candidates and uh, then kind of have a meeting greet where uh, the citizens can chat one on one. We gather that information. We, we 
feed it to uh, Patty, and Patty comes back with a recommendation. Uh, again, trying to do it as quickly as possible. I mean, I do think we would want to have an interview. Well, that's what I, I yes. Is there a council interview uh, first? Council? Yeah, however, whatever but, way but the council, order, council and the staff and the just the patty. I would think that, that would be an like important part of it. But the public, uh, a public venue where um, it's going to be internal candidates. These are going to be police officers who are going to work in our department. Um, I think it'll be great opportunity for any uh, applicants to speak to their uh, vision to uh, for our department, and um, so I think that could be really great and uh, interesting. And uh, so, I, so that would be good. Meet and greet sounds fine. But yeah, I, we obviously would need a, another to have also a interview with with Patty and the council right. who's going to well, participate. We could conceivably, I mean, I, I, I'm going to assume that there will be two to three candidates. Um, so we could conceivably do this in one night where council could have interviews. Um, that would be, you know, candidate A, candidate B, candidate C. Um, at the same time, uh, then after the interviews are done, you could have the, the formal mediator the you know the uh, forum where the public gets to ask questions of the candidates and followed by meet and greet um, that way if um, a citizen has a question that they want to ask they can ask it during the forum and if they're not going to be here they can submit that and we can give it to the mediators to present so if council wants to expedite this we can do it in one evening but my suggestion is you choose an evening because we need, to, we need to get it on the schedule if you right. want to have this right. done by June. It's a challenging month because of the holiday, yes. but um, so let's just pick something in the middle of May 16th. So ahead. there was talk about having uh, each council person pick a citizen to be involved in the decision-making process. I think that, we kind of moved on from that. I thought we moved on from that. So the interviews would be just counsel myself and Melissa. Yeah. And then the And then citizens. we hear from the So that was take I think Marianne that that was replaced by the open forum where um, the citizens could ask questions. Well, I think that's two very different things though. I mean, letting some a citizen ask a question is different than letting a letting some citizens be part of the decision making process. I, they, I, yeah, let's, let's stop and get some um, citizen well, can input. I, can I just ask for a clarification? Because uh, it wasn't clear to me. Did you mean that the moderated form would be all two or three candidates in yeah. one place yes. at one time? Okay, right. and then just to, to add to that, when you previously did that, there was a, um, a survey that everyone was handed out and they, that they could turn in so that they did get oh. they did provide feedback that was oh. uh, collated and, and handed oh, back yeah. just to say one thing I, I wanna, think that's good to do one thing I want to say when the process I was referring to uh, where we chose a citizen they didn't ultimately they weren't they that was when we hired Mark Cundiff as our village manager right. and um, we did an we did an interview with them. We chatted. We had a conversation. Council did with the citizens. We, ch we chose a, s a single citizen. Um, but then, and I think the way we did it then, then we had the public forum, and then council with staff came into executive session. We right. didn't have citizens, par you no, know, participating not. in the decision itself, which and, I don't think would right. be appropriate. And I think this is a very different situation with. Can, these are all going to be candidates that we all know well and that the community knows. In that situation, it was they were all unknown candidates. Laura, I saw your hand up. Uh, just, just a clarification. Um, Ordinance 242.02 .02 says the chief of police shall be appointed by the village manager and shall serve at the pleasure of the village manager as provided by the charter. And when I read this, and I'm sure the chief, potential chief candidates would like to know, 
it sounds like instead of being an advisory board, this is a being called a selection board and that these this group of people will be selecting the chief when it's really it seems like it's Patty's decision. It's more seems like advisory to her. I just want to clarify the process. Yeah, and that, and I think that is what we're thinking. Yes, right. and, and this really recommendation. Right, and this particular process isn't really even being discussed at all because this is an external process. Yeah. Pat, but that's a good point. Thank you, Laura. Just have a, a couple of comments. Um, I wonder. Um, you can't assume how many internal candidates. I mean, in internal postings, sometimes people just want to practice even. You could have, I mean, you're not going to have the entire force, but you could have, <laughs> you know, five people might show up, six. I mean, so what is the first sort of selection? I mean, in the full search, you would have, you know, 100 applicants would apply, and then you'd decide, you'd winnow it down in a selection process and say, well, these two, and then these are our finalists. Mm -hmm. And that is a, certainly a more efficient process. But I also think that considering the events of the last couple of months, that we do need to do some good thinking about citizen involvement and making the selection process and the decision-making process very transparent to people. Who's doing it? Thanks, Pat. So Do you have a suggestion, Pat, about the? I'd have to think some more about it. <laughs> well, I think I think I think Pat makes a good point about the potential number of candidates. So, if there are more than three, um, you know, I could uh, regroup with council individually, um, you know, each member um, to discuss potential ways to proceed. I mean, I don't want to say we're only interviewing three because then if we get four, you're only eliminating one. Right. Where on the other hand, if you get five, you know, God. now you're getting into a lot of interviews. But we would interview all candidates. If, if that's what council wants, yes, but you're not going to do it in one night. And you're not going to be able to do everything in one night then. Does the job description, I mean, will we, we have looked at the job description as possible that that would um, that that would be a limit a limiting factor for candidates. I I feel like we should. Uh, I mean, we we don't want to drag it out. On the other hand, I don't think we should be rushing. Uh, and so, yeah. I mean, I I I think Pat makes a good point. Just I mean, are we going to interview everybody? Not necessarily. I don't think that would necessarily be the thing to do. Um, and. We'll have a meeting before, won't we have a meeting? We'll have a meeting on the 15th. So depending on what day, I think yeah. somebody said the 16th. So you're only having it the day before. Yeah, that. It could be that you schedule one night for interviews and then do the public forum and meet and greet on a different night. That may be what we end up having to that, do if yeah. we get multiple candidates. Um, I, I agree. I, I, if we're only going to do an internal search, that's already taken months off this process. So let's do it as good as we can. And I don't think we need to have it done in a couple of weeks or even in a month. Um, Dave, uh, I saw Dave's yeah. hand up well, first. Yeah, David Turner, I guess several of you already said part of what I was going to say. I agree with what you were saying, Pat. I, I don't see a need to rush it get it over with, but an extra few days, an extra couple of weeks, or even a month probably won't make any difference. And if you don't do a good job of this, a significant, significant uh, number of people in the community are going to see the chief is tainted no matter what a great guy or gal he, they happen to be. So I think it's more important to take the time to figure out a process that seems to be rushed and convoluted. Thanks, Dave. Um, pretty much what I was thinking, what you said just now. I think we should be very careful with the next candidate we choose because a lot of things are riding on it. We haven't had a lot of good luck. We have had some issues in town. Some of them go back. Some of them are maybe forgotten. We've made some advances, especially with CIT training that could have 
been involved in my son's death, possibly, who knows. The thing is, this is very important to me and my family. My grandson right now is in for four years in a penitentiary. They just decided that. Uh, one of our police officers was involved in arresting him. They, the um, people said that he should get two years or three years for what he did. He wasn't helped very much. They wanted, all he said, he should get seven years to the prosecutor who recommended that. He is 22 years old. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't really hurt anybody. He did something stupid. Now he has a drug addiction like his father did. His father was murdered here. He's acting it out. He's not gotten the help in these last four or five years. I'm here to tell you we need to do better. I'm here to say this is not acceptable to just pick somebody and we hope this will work this time. I think we should do well and um, make sure that we don't rush it because it sounds like we're doing that. Okay, thank you very much. Could you say your name? My name is Uta Sheng. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Uta. Any other citizen comments? So I'd, I'd like to make one, one comment, is that, you know, the process may seem like we're rushing it, but I personally have received many, many inputs from the community since the incident occurred on New Year's Eve, okay? And I've also received a lot of positive inputs from the community in the direction that council has taken since that incident, okay? And we are trying to come to closure. The closure is coming up with an individual that knows the community and the community knows them and being able to provide the service and also the direction to our department that we feel that we need. I, I'm willing to extend the schedule a couple of weeks, but I don't want it to go into late June or July. Because to me, that's going to discourage our present members of our force that, that may be interested in the position. We have put a lot of pressure on our staff to try to help with the process. But they can only do it so long and, and so hard. And we need to provide them with the leadership that, that they need so that the community can, uh, can move forward. And, and, and that's my push for getting the process done. And, and I feel that we can come up with a process that will involve those in the community that want to participate in the process so we can, so we can move forward. And, uh, Again, I'm, I'm, myself, I'm very confident that we have the local resources, the local individuals that understand the community and can, can lead the troops and get back to what everyone has been calling in the past, the, the Jim McKee, the uh, John Grody era, we have young individuals, I feel, and old also, that can get us back to that, that way of living, if you, if you want to call it anything else. How about, so Patty's, 
Patty suggested a May 1, well, this today's May 1, a May 2 to May 10 job posting to get the applications in. How about if we pick one date if we get more than two applications, we cancel. We, we cancel or, or we, you know, go forward and, and indicate that we want as many, as many internal candidates as, as, as are interested to apply. Um, I would just, I wouldn't mind getting a date on the table. Um, maybe we put a date in the table and we decide if it's going to be maybe council will just do interviews if there are more than two candidates and then we'll schedule another uh, another meeting for um, the community another opportunity for the community could you potentially just select go ahead and select two dates and then cancel the second one if you don't that's a good idea that's a good idea because at least then we're preparing mm -hmm. Um, my schedule is pretty restricted this month, um, but uh, the 16th would work for me, and the 30th are about, and, and then for some Fridays, but I don't think anybody wants to do it on Friday. Yeah, that's a lot to do on a Friday. Those, those two dates work for me. I'm flexible. They work for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I'm so we can talk about what I'm, I'm trying to think is is the interview the interview would be first and then the uh, the uh, public, public, public venue after right. that mm -hmm. I think it might make sense well depending uh, on how many yeah considering the fact that those dates are, are pretty far apart it would seem that we would probably do maybe do the council interviews first and then maybe have the public one rather than separate yeah candidates. i was going to say if i if i can't be to the at the public uh you mean have the public interview on the on 30th? the 30th if there were multiple well, candidates well, rather than separating them but the other thing is weeks. if we want it to be available to the community then the people community needs to have time to know that it's available and if we're leaving it up in the air then they're not going to know i mean if on the 10th we have more candidates but we can say that the 16th, I mean, the 16th is, is a firm meeting. We can say May 16th. Well, not necessarily because if, oh, I, I, um, go ahead. Here's what I would suggest is that um, because there was a suggestion about, Judy said something about when the forum happened, people had response, um, you know, questions and, and comment cards with responses on them. My suggestion would be that council do the interviews on the 16th, no matter how many they have, set the public forum and the meet and greet for the 30th. That gives us time to design, you know, a, uh, a response card mm -hmm. with the categories or the, the thoughts or, uh, on it. It also gives the citizens time to think about the questions they want to ask at the forum, submit them ahead of time to the mediators. Um, and if that's the case, we could likely either still have it by the June 5th meeting or definitely have it by the June 19th meeting. That seems okay. reasonable. Do you, it, are, is there a reason you don't want to look at May 22nd, which is a fourth Monday? I'm okay. going to be out of it. Okay. Sorry. I just, but it's not I may, can I, may I ask Judith if, yeah. if we do the interviews on the 16th? Um, I thought that you said that, it, that the public forum, you thought it would be okay if you were not at the public. I don't think I need, I, I absolutely need to be there, no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I feel that, I mean, this is part of the participation in the decision-making process is mm -hmm. that public forum. So we're set, it looks like we're set on May 16th for council interviews and May 30th for public, for public interview process. Correct. And we still have May 13th or May 15th, excuse me, May 15th meeting if we want maybe to get some more public input on what that meeting on May 30th should look like. Uh -huh. um, we still have some planning time for that. 
Any other comments from council? Citizens before we move on? Um, and we, then we should contact um, John Gudgel, I think, about getting some facilitators for the 30th. I think, yeah, one of you two, yeah, whoever. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. So Just Melissa needs to leave. Okay. What was that last? Contact uh, me to village I, I will take care of that, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is um, some justice system task force recommendations to council. It looks like there are two um, recommendations in this particular packet. Um, I see that uh, that Pat DeWeese is here. Judith, I don't know if you are um, Marianne or who is going to be interested. Dave Turner Dave. is going to speak to the uh, recommendation on the mayor's court. Okay. And then. Yeah. Okay. I assume you all saw what was in the packet, so I'm not going to read it. it consists of text, charts, graphs, paragraph on the back, each one explain what each one was. Basically, we like the mayor's court. Everybody likes the mayor's court. We want to keep it. So our recommendation is um, that there are limitations on the types of cases can be heard, but for those that may be heard, we recommend the village manager direct the police to send all possible cases to mayor's court. That's our recommendation. <laughs> Great. It's already been done. But okay. Yeah. That's I mean, that, this is the first step. The next discussion is going to be about the question of a uh, prosecutor, which we're, uh, the committee, the working group is suggesting uh, they be called mediator. Um, uh, Dave and Al Schluter and uh, I think Cindy's on that committee and Steve McQueen are on that uh, working group. And, um, but uh, you guys in particular, you, uh, Dave and Al, have looked into the other mayor's court, several other mayor's courts in the state and their, the prosecutor role is, is being uh, done in different ways. So we're going to be talking about that at our next meeting, kind of thinking about that next step, which, uh, which I also know that uh, Chris wants to, uh, you know, have input on that as well. But we're going to be just getting information at our next meeting and then trying to, and then I was thinking maybe the next meeting after that, if, if you would be able to come to our committee. This is the camera can show I'm nodding my head, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the second Tuesday of the month. <laughs> so get it on your calendar. Okay. Chief and or Patty, um, do either of you have any, any numbers? Um, in just changes, um, uptick in use of mayor's court over the past couple of months? I don't, I don't know, Chief. No, it's, it's actually been a little slower. Um, Can so you come up, yeah. please? Sorry. Citations have been down since New Year's Eve a little bit. I think everyone's a little apprehensive. and uh, But we, you know, we have sent out an email requesting that anything that can be placed in mayor's court uh, be done so and, and it has been happening um, we just don't have as many citations written lately that is not a problem yeah. <laughs> and, and could in my and book <laughs> is that something judith that that the task force could do is just um because this this issue of of confusion between what can be cited to mayor's court and what can't be could that be something that is summarized and I don't know if that's something that would come from Chris Patty but just just to get that out on paper I mean Chief, well, Chief's yeah, got the Dave, booklet Dave, and Dave it's has you it. want to address this yeah you don't want me to address it but you asked well I, <laughs> I appreciate it yeah the chief gave me this booklet labeled criminal <laughs> <laughs> and I estimate that it's about 50 let's see about 30 typewritten eight and a half by 11 pages so we spent the last several months in the justice system task force talking about should we say send everything to mayor's court which as i said immediately or send a generic list of kinds of things or send the full list i've had so much time discussing this that i'm not going to talk about it anymore i'll let you guys work it out and i'll, I'll give you this back <laughs> the, the problem is there's so there seems to not be do. an electronic copy of that because don't, don't sit down no. <laughs> <laughs> It's you my understanding is, there's, <laughs> is that there's not an electronic copy, and when you go to the Ohio Revised Code, it is very difficult to understand. It's not helpful at all. Well, who, who needs, and who needs to know this? 
Well, I think it is helpful to know. I would like to know. I mean, well, I think it, citizens, it would, I, just because we, you know, we're, we're kind of bombarded with complaints about the police citing things to Xenia when maybe those things are being cited to Xenia because they have to be. And so I don't like our officers being criticized for things that they have no choice over. So something so, that's written down so that the perhaps a booklet that your officers can hand to somebody and say, see right here, <laughs> here's this website citation saying you have to go to mayor's court or you, you may go to mayor's court or you, know, you have to go to Xenia, something like that. That's Officer. Right. Well, so my question, Dave, is so it sounds like there are, there's a long list of things that can go to mayor's court. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about the flip side, the things that cannot? Is that a isn't that a bigger size? <laughs> is it yeah. murder, murder, awful any stuff? Felony, and no felony court cases can go to mayor's court. Yeah. There are very few felonies that are already come out of jail. I don't know. I don't know the numbers on that. Okay. I, my guess would it be a lot. Um, well, okay. Well, I would agree if we could summarize on a page. We don't need to have every you know subcategory of offense of what can or can't go. Right. Um, that yeah, it's would be very easy. Useful. Yeah, it's very easy to say no felony cases can go to mayor's court. I mean, those kind. I don't need to see all of the felony arrests. Yeah, I need. I just. Right. But some misdemeanors can have to go, right, Chief? I'm sorry. Some misdemeanors have to go to Xenia, right? Yes. And no. some Juvenile. don't have to go to Xenia. Juveniles have to go to Xenia. And some, you know, and there's something about, you know, the, the you know, there's a lot of confusion about first OVI versus right. Right. not first OVI. Right. And and so you just use the right word, confusion. And so we're can you're asking maybe the, the working group to and, yes, somebody, if you can somehow I said maybe it's staff, maybe it's I don't know if it's the JSTF. I mean, it, it's just information I would like our citizens to have because it is a source of frustration for people and misunderstanding. Let, let, let Chief and I get together. Maybe yeah. we can um, come up with a list. So well, one thing that I think is important is it, it all boils to... down in the end to officer discretion. Mm -hmm. So that's what. Hopefully the philosophy can change. Once you're past the, the legal you know, decision, is, does this have to go to you know, Xenia or can it stay in Mayor's Court? Now we're at the officer using their discretion. Well, and that's something I know we discussed at our committee, um, and I have to say I'm, I'm not entirely, Chief, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely convinced that's true, that we have to give that discretion. Um, I so that's something that's a discussion that I that I would like to to get more clarity on. Did I know? It's always good to start with the ordinance book, and there is chapter six has the general offenses that are in the Yellow Springs ordinance book, and there's a mirror image of those in the revised code, and it's they're the same offenses. It's simply a ch it's simply a choice of the officers whether to charge it under the revised code which goes to Xenia or charge it under chapter 6 which comes to mayor's court so for example you know for example we had a citizen charged with criminal damaging of Yellow Springs property Yellow Springs citizen Yellow Springs witnesses where did that case go Xenia. thank you and the reason, and so no, I don't, I think we can have a policy that if it can be charged into mayor's court, it is. If the mayor has a conflict because he knows one of the parties is related, the mayor then, it's on him to recuse himself and then work that out. But um, that's why you have them in your ordinance book, so they can be charged under your ordinance. Thank you. Um, Thanks, the, Laura. The, I, I'd like to say that this recommendation, like probably most of the recommendations coming out of the Justice Task Force is not simple. And it's also 20 of 10. And I don't think that we're going to iron it out right now. Right. So I have a suggestion for all of the recommendations, which is that we create a working document book that puts the recommendation in, has it come to council, what's the process, and Brian, probably you're good at some kind of graph thing, so that we have everything, but everything is going to need more work probably. I mean, this is a good example. Even in the thing, you're, we're 
We don't know if we're going to have a prosecutor. We don't have restorative justice now. I mean, there are lots of things for all these. But if we can start putting things in a book and saying this is where it is and then then we'll have everything and at some point everything will get ironed out and it won't get lost. But I don't think we're going to solve this well, issue tonight. Yep, I agree. Um, Al wants to speak, but go ahead, Dave, and then we'll hear from Al, and then we'll move on to the next. Justice System Task Force, I was puzzled last meeting when somebody made a recommendation for Justice System Task Force, which was very specific, taser policy, taser use policy, and another one, and then one council person said, so what do we do? And another council person said, gee, I don't know. You guys asked us to do things like give you recommendations. I'm puzzled as to why when we give you recommendations you haven't figured out what to do with them ahead of time I can tell you that I, this is the first time we've ever done this I'd like, and I'd like we're to learning, ask you to, to do some more figuring out ahead of time and, and, and I like and, what you're saying but we're I feel like you know this is me speaking as me not as a member of the task force but as a member of the task force if we keep going back and forth we're never going to finish the conversation we but are all of the recommend all of the recommendations the recommendations that we discussed at the last meeting all said that they needed to go back to the JSTF for more work none of none of them but that's were not, ready that's not to adopt. I don't believe that's true but I mean I I agree with you Dave that there's some disjuncture but um, and I'm not quite sure what to do about that we suggested a recommendation that it be required to go to CIT training, which, you know, we just heard from our chief. It was an excellent training. Council all agreed, but then we weren't willing to make it a resolution. We weren't willing to make it a, you know, a, and I'm, I'm not, I'm confused by the council, I have to say. So then the taser policy, we're, we maybe want to do this. Um, I, we're going to be discussing next week about this idea of, notice and comments so we can be hearing all concerns taser policy is a specific thing that police officers work with a piece of equipment they work with how they use it when they use it um, so you know fine we're gonna we're gonna we may need to look at that again I don't know it's it feels like we're going back and forth that's the way I feel as well the implicit bias training we know that that's a good idea um, I'm not sure what else the, the committee's supposed to do. And now we're going to hear a recommendation about the social worker, and I'm not sure what we're supposed to. I mean, there's a, there is a big issue around that, which is the cost. And so I see it as a, something that is in, uh, you know, how do you fit that into a budget? How do you pay for it? It's an excellent idea, you know, that council may say yes we like that idea we want to consider you know adding that person to our staff but anyway i'm just jabbering on but uh well, I I need to, you guys need to figure out okay. what you're going to do and you guys need to be a little more clear about what you want from us right I, I think we have figured out a lot of things so i want to say a few things and then how you will get up here right after so uh first of all with many of these recommendations we have discussed and i think consensus for a preamble that layered on top of the general operations manual that memorializes or formalizes all these things. So I think we have talked about that and we just need to move that into a process. We understand that the taser policy is something that is not necessarily an ordinance, but it does have to be changed formally in that GOM. And I think most importantly, every recommendation that has come, we have approved the idea that we agree with it in principle and Chief Carlson has implemented it. So I think that's the main thing that we're hearing. So I agree with Mary Ann, this is new territory because council has not been involved as involved like this before. But I think we have come up with uh, ways that we can formalize this and we will do that soon. You and I need to talk because I need to understand it if I'm gonna be the liaison. Yes, I, I truly well, am confused myself, so just to say. And one thing is maybe when we have this kind of discussion, if we're having a whole council discussion, we need to have it earlier than quarter of 10. Because this is very serious stuff. We've never done it before. We don't really have a full process. It, and, and, if, and if we remember at the last meeting, we actually had our chief come up and talk for about 10 minutes about how 
he's having a lot of difficulty. He's in, in an interim position and he's having a lot of difficulty finding the time and the ability to, to implement these things that we're saying we want him to implement. That just happened at the last meeting. And, and now it's like we're turning around and it's like all of a sudden we want things implemented immediately. Um, we have, you know, we've sat here, we've made motions, we have supported, said we support all of these things. That doesn't mean that every detail is ready to be turned into a law, in, into an ordinance. It just, we're, I just feel we're not ready. And um, we've, and I agree, we've got to have a process for that to happen. Um, but, but it's also very difficult when we're talking about a huge department, we're, ta we're not talking about a huge department, we're talking about a police department, we're talking about a lot of people, we're talking about a big order, what, what is that called? General, General Orders Manual. And we're piecemealing little policies and I just can't believe that at some point those policies don't interact with each other and if we keep piecemealing little things at a time that we're going to that we're going to come up against something that we've just made one change that's going to impact another piece i i feel like doing this doing this one thing's brought to us and we make a decision i i don't think that's that, the way that, to do that's it that's why i was suggesting I, that's, that I, we that's why i agree with you book, i agree and we yes. just sort of track where things I are and at I the agree. End, when we get everything together, then we can look at it. Al? I, I mean, I just, I think you're making two, all you have to look at the, is this graph and see what's happened from 1,200 cases uh, down to less than 200. If we don't do something, we're not going to have a mayor's court. Virtually everyone in town thinks the mayor's court is a good thing we're trying to and all we were wanting you to do is to give support to the chief so that when he tells the officers that all the cases that can go to the mayor's court should go to the mayor's court it would carry weight if you uh, have backed him on that it's the, you know, I mean, you, we can we can spend years trying to get the details of all the all of the conditions it's a general philosophy that has been the philosophy in the past but it changed with some of our recent police uh, officer uh, chiefs yes and now the, the mayor's court is in jeopardy of 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 um, uh, being abolished and the justice system task force exists because we want more use of mayor's court that's exactly one of the reasons we started it we've got to have the process we've got to get to the details if I think Chief Carlson has heard from council that that's what we are expecting he sent an email to his officers to use mayor's court as much as possible Pat I'm sorry um, we're we as a community and as a council police department uh, committees citizens we're involved uh, we've committed ourselves to police reform we're not the only community in the country doing this this is a national movement it's recognizing that we want to move the whole metaphor especially at the smaller local level from warrior culture connected to drug war that has been the metaphor we're moving that to local guardianship policing that aligns with village values we have to keep this big picture because this is a culture change and culture change takes years and we need to always sort of think well we're not making a list of things to get done quickly we, at, I think in March, I presented the, the federal um, Department of Justice format of the six pillars of justice, a model. Now we know in the Justice System Task Force has, I mean everyone on it has dug into research, models, conceptualizing what are we talking about when we're talking about community policing? What are we talking about? What is the model? What are the qualities of this? So I just want to remind everyone, um, including Chief Carlson, this is not something we're doing this month. This is something that's going to take quite a bit of time to make this big change in how we understand local policing. 
Um, and I somewhat agree with Mary Ann, although I, again, I think it's a mistake to come up with a list and then a how to fix the list. I think we do have to keep something like maybe six pillars of justice is too complicated for this small a community. But we have to keep some kind of a model and a vision of what we're talking about and keep it, keep these recommendations into, inserted into this model so we start to see what might be missing, or what, what it is we need to work on. So it's getting kind of late, but we do have one more recommendation. Yes. Should we go for it? Yes. I, okay. Kate, this oh, uh, recommendation, um, no. which would be to the Justice System Task Force, recommends the village council, directs the village manager, an interim chief of police, to pursue the hiring of a social worker to work within the department. Now, the research for this and the work for this um, was done by Kate Hamilton, but she's lost her voice, and Bill. You still have your voice, right? I have my voice. You need it. So we have, there is a way to answer questions that I wouldn't be able to answer. But basically, this is something that has been evolving, and um, other states have sort of initiated this. Illinois in particular, Kate spoke to many of the departments. There are over 30 departments in the state of Illinois that have a police social work, which is actually a career job someone who is trained both in policing and social work. And the logic behind it, uh, I think we pointed out when we talked about crisis intervention training, is that our officers, like most officers, spend a great deal of time in what it, we might call social work. We're talking about some, you know, the kinds of um, issues like troubled youth, um, domestic violence, suicide threats, things that really take some very, um, that are quite emotional, that are related to crisis intervention. And our officers have already started um, learning more about the skills of de-escalation. However, there's something that has to go past just the quick intervention. And having a social worker on staff, part-time or full-time, has made a big difference and research has shown that um, it really has an impact and you have the, you have the argument here um, it is, again, a budget item, and so in terms of next steps, the idea was that a group would form to look at the funding aspect, because there actually there is some levels of funding that would be available to communities. Um, different ways that, of funding that. Now, um, I know that Kate and Bill have talked to uh, Chief Carlson about this, and to Manager Bates, who both supported the concept, and could see the ways that it could be really make a change in some of the uh, burdens of our officers. Well, I think it was particularly incredible that, that Chief Carlson has spent so much time last week in the, in the social work arena, right. so that really gives him some hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think this one is an easy one, just, just to keep that work, just keep doing that work. I mean, I would... I think the motion that I'm going to make is that uh, council uh, what was your wording? Council direct Patty, uh, our, yeah, our village manager, our with chief. our interim chief to pursue, uh, to pursue uh, the hiring full time or part time of a social worker. Now, this doesn't mean it's happening next week or next month, um, but it's 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 a concept. If we don't put it on the table, if it's put in a little file of, of ideas, it's never going to happen. And um, how exactly we're going to make it happen, we're not sure. So, so anyway, that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. So. Opposed. Okay. okay. So you're opposed. Okay. So uh, what I would like to also uh, uh, go along with, uh, you know, Pat's suggestion that there be a small uh, working group that works with with uh, Patty around the issue of trying to consider how to, you know, all the details of how to do this, you, you which know, would be funding. Uh, uh, well, I know there's already uh, job descriptions that other places have ha uh, have developed, but you know, sort of the next steps. Yeah, I, when when we met with with Kate, I mean, it was wonderful what you guys have done. Yeah. Um, and Kate, as soon as you're feeling better, because no offense, <laughs> but I don't want to sit at the table with you because <laughs> um, I know you've been really sick. Um, just get a hold of me, and we'll start working on it. Um, I. I you know, 
we didn't have time for discussion. I mean, you made the motion and we voted. We didn't have time for discussion. I mean, I think it's a great idea, but I also am very concerned about the budget. And I'd much rather um, see how we are going to fund such a thing uh, than just direct staff to hire well, I am assuming that, and no, I apologize no. for the quick vote. I am assuming that, and I personally, I, I'm not thrilled with the language. I probably would have, to, to research the hiring or to investigate, I probably would have then pursue. That sounds a little, but I, and I personally think this should be a 2018. This, we should be talking about 2018 budget, not trying to fit this into the 2017 budget. And, and I'm not suggesting that we have an increased, uh, you know, police budget, actually. I think we have to, we're going to have to, be, when we're talking about a, a changing culture, we're, we're talking about thinking about things in a different way. If, I don't know what, what percentage of, of police uh, cases are more, more social work cases. Did you say 80%? 80%. So if you're, so your whole approach is so different that it really can change the way you are, you know, populating your department. So that's a long-term thing, but if you don't start thinking about it and planning, you know, how you're going to try to do that, I mean, it's, it's a long-term goal. But it goal. seemed to me like we didn't think about it. We just voted, and now we're thinking about it. I mean, no, I feel so no, no, no. no, let's let's think about this but, for a minute. And but I know, it is 10 o'clock, yeah, so I've we don't been, have to figure it all out. I've probably today. been half asleep, but <laughs> I think what I heard was that we made a motion to have Patty and the chief start investigating how we might possibly move in the direction of hiring a uh, social worker. That's how I interpret that's, it. That's, that's, that's not what I heard. That, I heard. That, that's what I thought I heard. That's what I voted, that's what I voted yeah. on. I so. would, and I agree with you, Jerry. I would like to actually modify, suggest we modify, because I would like there to be investigation of other avenues of social work support for our department sim beyond just having an employee. I can't imagine that there aren't resources out there that we could take advantage of. So I would like it to be... Kate's, <laughs> Kate's got a lot of information yeah. about how these so, things are So done. rather than simply concentrating on hiring a staff person, I would like to learn more about any other avenues of social work support that we could get, that we could utilize. So. Is council willing to, okay. But, and I guess I feel like that is what the proposal is. Yeah, that it is. We, there are different options and we have uh, to figure out what the best one is. That's what I understand. I would have preferred a more general, but I agree with you that we can, I can support it. I, I don't think that's actually what it is. That's not it. That's actually not it. So, the, I can try. Go ahead and try. Uh, uh, well, I have a lot of information that you can look over. Um, basically, the, what a, the police social worker does is they know about all of these um, different things that are available out there for you know the different social services, and they connect the dots. So they are sort of the person that, um, what is the word for it, <clears throat> facilitates the connections and um, instead of having to piecemeal all of that together, because we have that now. Because if you go down there now and you talk to one of the officers, they'll give you a card for TCN, they'll give you a card for the mediators, they'll give you a card for this, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I have this. And so this would be a person that would know all of those connections, and an officer could say, hey, I met with this person last night, and they don't seem to have family in town, he's really elderly, and then the social worker would go talk to that person and then connect them with the service that they need. And that way, the officer as well can be kept in the loop about what happens with that person later on. And it does cut back on calls because you'll have someone that calls constantly, uh, an officer to come, you know, I don't know, I always use this dumb example of finding their glasses. But once you've had the social worker come in, connect them with the services they need, that will cut back on their calls to the officers who could be doing other things that are more officer-like, if that okay. makes sense. Well, and some of the officer-like things like, you know, addiction, you know, which is something that tends to end up in criminal justice. You know, if, if, if you've got a social worker helping get that person get treatment or something like that, you know, theoretically, you know, it's much more the, not the warrior, but the um, guardian, as uh, Pat was saying. It's moves, it really moves us in that direction. 
I mean, anyway, I, we should explore it. I don't know. Exactly. I have tons of information. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cover so, so, so I, I, yeah, I'd, I like to work with Kate on that. Okay. So, it sounds like we're okay. good on that. We had a. Thank you. We made it. Are you? We made a decision. So we have a we have a <laughs> four four one a motion and a four to one vote. Okay. Um, moving on to the housing needs assessment, um, Marianne. Well, on Friday. Mm -hmm. On Friday, several of us had a. I'll, I'll let it go. <laughs> several of us um, had a phone conversation with Patrick Bowen and his assistant Desiree Johnson, uh, who are um, let's see, they're a real estate analyst organization out of Columbus, Ohio. The purpose uh, of discussing uh, with them was to get some more sense of, well, what is in a housing needs assessment? What should we be asking for? What might the cost be? Um, and um, we had gotten their name from Emily Seibel, who has <coughs> hired them for Home Inc. So the, the, the reason why we are wanting to do a housing needs assessment is, first of all, to inform us about um, what our housing needs are <coughs> currently and into the, well, whatever amount of time we decide, I was saying five to 10 years. Um, so what is the current state of our housing? Um, and looking into the future, what, what uh, would our housing needs be? And um, there are a number of kind of things that a housing needs assessment can, data that can, uh, it can gather. It can look at uh, the current housing stock, the age of the housing stock, the high, the size of the houses, the price range, what they're selling for. Uh, it can look at the income um, uh, of the residents in our village and uh, are, what are they paying for housing? Um, what kind of gaps are there in terms of what people want and what we have? Um, do we have housing for uh, special needs people? Do we have senior housing? Do we have workforce housing? It can look at a lot of different, um, we can get a lot of different data from a study and we need to know what's the most important data that we want. <coughs> So we want so the, so to do this, we could just look at the glass farm. But if we're going to do this, we might as well be looking at something that can get information for the whole village because it's not only the glass farm that is a potential site for development. So um, it would seem that depending on how wide a net we want to throw, uh, housing cost. Uh, the housing needs assessment would cost from about ten to thirty thousand dollars. If we and if keeping it under thirty thousand, I think would enable Patty to do it without putting out bids. Although we certainly would want to get some well, I, formal bid process. Well, thirty thousand is my spending limit. Um, however, I mean, you may still want to do a formal RFP. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we would do a formal. I um, mean, presumably we would. So um, part of the discussion was then looking at are there other entities uh, in Yellow Springs that might want to be involved in putting some money into a housing needs assessment, might want to have some particular questions being asked. So um, depending on how what council uh, might say, what my next thing uh, that I was going to suggest to do is to invite some other groups in town, for example, someone from the schools, Friends Care, Home Inc., uh, any other, uh, Green Mat, any organization that we think might want to be involved to have a meeting to find out 
are they interested in finding out more about housing for whatever their uh, constituency group is? Um, so I'm going to stop now. I'm sort of worn out, actually. Any comments, questions from council? Um, Denise is going to be involved in this. The, yeah. So the people who were on this phone call were uh, Patty Bates, Denise Swinger, Karen Wintrow, myself, and Brittany from Home Inc. And I think we found Patrick Bowen to be very helpful, I mean, certainly very knowledgeable. And we also have resources, so we have sample RFPs. For we ha I have one um, housing needs assessment that was done for a community not too dissimilar from uh, Yellow Springs, you see the kind of information that can be gotten. So what you're asking at this point is is maybe for the next step of, of you know, c contacting other community organizations and, and... Yeah, I want to see what kind of questions, concerns, ideas council has. Um, and you know that price and as I you know I was there part of the reason we're talking about the other bringing in some potential funders is that each one of these pieces costs a certain amount of money and so if there is information that might help inform but we wouldn't necessarily need it there might be somebody out there that would be interested in in doing a little bit more study say on senior housing or something like that so um, I think that there's a lot of potential. I've got a list of almost 10 here that I think might mm -hmm. be potential, even for just a small amount of money, um, because I think it's going to provide actually great information for the commute for the entire community. I mean, it's something the schools were talking about. You know, how many students to expect um, right. moving into the future. So, you know, one thing I I could have uh, given this to council, um, I didn't, but I can do it for the next packet is what um, what I had written up for this phone call, which will give you more of an idea of what was involved. I'll put that in the next council packet. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, without getting into the detail of, uh, of it, I feel like we should put some kind of time frame around this because I'm, because I would like, you know, us to get this accomplished mm -hmm. by, you know, for us to have kind of a deadline as to when we want to get the RFP out and then when we want to have it completed. Yeah, I, I agree. It pro it, we could say it and might take three months to do the study, um, a month or so to get the RFP together. So I'm definitely by the end of this calendar year, we should have it and, and completed. I'm sorry. Well, make sure you build in your advertising time and time to review your app, app you know, your responses for, mm -hmm. to the RFP because that's as that's time consuming as well. You I'll, have to not only write it to the specs that you want, but you have to. But we can't write the specs until we correct. know who might have an interest. So that so correct. how long will that process take of sort of identifying? I mean, I'd like to get that done that in the next reach. couple of weeks. Did, are you going out of town, Marianne? Mm, not okay. I'd like to go I mean, out. I, I'd like to. I'd like to maybe get that done in the next couple of weeks. Okay. okay. So, am I understanding correctly that this this could be a collaborative effort then with those groups to formulate right. that RFP? Potentially. Right. Potentially. Right. Okay. Um, one thing I didn't hear listed out, but I, I would I think would be important is sort of this piece of what's the impact on the community, the affordability, that sort of thing, just, you know, as, as we look at um, different ways that we build out the housing stock, what's that going to mean? Um, and that ties to utilities and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's maybe more of a sophisticated analysis, but I think and do you it mean the just the well, cost of the, those utility extensions? What do you? Uh, that, but also but he's like saying they don't pay the benefit of sort of having more. Right. Right. Okay. But isn't that something that our staff can do? Well, it was the we did talk during the the phone call. If I, if I'm understanding what you're meaning, Brian, we did talk during the phone call about the percentages. Like if we have the ability to build X number of homes, right. uh, what percentage of those should be market value homes, what percentages should be low income, that, what percentages should be senior, um, and that affordability piece was included in there, 
not necessarily to continue on and to, into the impact of the support of our utilities, but and as taxes a, and that kind a, of thing is so. an overall concept. Right. So, so I guess I just wanted to be figured out if we can do that analysis in house. Great. Well, I think part of what they'll tell us, what this, what this study will tell us, is is what kind of housing, what kind of a variety of housing, like how much affordable housing we need, how much senior housing we need. And then I think at that point, that might be something that staff could take those numbers. I mean, you know about if it's affordable housing, there's a price range, and and so that's going to generate so many ta so much property in taxes value property value so i think that there might be a way to extrapolate out what you're asking for which is basically how it impacts the overall cost of living in the village is that what you're asking sure because okay. i mean i that's why we care about this right I think. right i mean yeah. so i just want to make sure well, it's, it's not driven the only reason. <laughs> yeah it's not the only reason right? i'm not saying it's the only reason yeah. but i think it, it it's high on the list and I just want to make sure that you know we're we're thinking about the goals behind why we're doing this. You know, it's it's, it's a planning tool, but ultimately, you know, it's just about how we're shaping the village and and again how it ties to utilities, affordability, taxes. So when schools. you say goals, you, the goals for why we would want more housing. Sure. Is that what you? And I agree. I think there's a lot of a lot of factors. Um, I just don't want to lose that in sort of the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nuts and bolts. Okay, I'm writing that down. Um, okay, so so Marianne and I will work on getting this next okay, meeting good. together, and then if Marianne can, I don't know if we need to have it as a discussion item at the next meeting, but at least if she could have these some of the materials sh that we've received, um, she could have those in the packet just for council, or even yeah. just send them out to council. Um, for council well, review, put in the packet so, if yeah. so citizens can see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, new business. We've got nominations. I think believe we have two nominations for the Economic Sustainability Commission. Yes. So um, first of all, Luciana Leaf, uh, who is an alternate, um, and she's been uh, she is the secretary. Uh, we would like to, or I would like to nominate her for a full position. And then we have a, a new member. Um, we have their information uh, on our table, which is uh, Sammy Sauber, um, also to fill that second uh, full position. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to nominate uh, two really stellar individuals for this commission. I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And uh, the Tecumseh Land Trust request, uh, who wants to handle that one? I'll, I'll take okay. Um, this is the, we get this every year from TLT. It's requesting a sponsorship um, for the harvest auction. Um, they are requesting that, I believe, a, a green tractor sponsorship, which is what we did with them last year. Um, it was, uh, it's $250 and uh, they filled out the form uh, there you can see uh, came through my office uh, as was required and you know, here for council approval. I move that we approve their, rec their, their uh, request. Second. All those in favor? Any discussion? I think um, we're yeah. <laughs> the, the only thing is let's just make sure we get on the program this year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, we've done our reports. Um, I, I want to say I think <coughs> it's, it's good doing the reports earlier. You know, just having done it tonight, I feel like there's so much information that's so great what the staff is doing, and citizens are not hearing that information. Mm -hmm. And so I just I felt like it was really good. So I I would like to change that on our agenda. Okay. I know we have to. I don't think anyway. we need to. I think we can do Make it. Um, we, yeah, okay. we don't need. Yeah, to I just thought that was really good. Rules. Okay. So, so future agenda items. Um, so we will have the glass farm easement. Um, that's that. <laughs> it's in TLT's hands. I mean, they're working with their surveyor. Unfortunately, he was in the hospital, oh. um, which could be part of the reason that he didn't get this to us in time. Um, I mean, we're ready on our end. We're just waiting for the revised, uh, the revised survey attached, you know, exhibit. So. Okay. Um, uh, 
we've got two pieces of legislation on the Gustafson property. I know that she's anxious to move forward on that, so hopefully that's moving forward and she's understanding and... I, I think it is. Jessica's working on that project. Okay. Um, we've got the resolution related to the enterprise zone agreement that uh, between uh, the Green County Board of Commissioners and the Village of Yellow Springs and uh, Judy, can we change that to DMSINK instead of Dayton Mailing Services? That's their new name. And Paul Newman Jr. from um, Green County Department of Development will be here to present that. And INK is lowercase. The I is an uppercase. Um, resolution 2017, let's see. Adopting guidelines for policing for the village of Yellow Springs. So that's the. That's the, isn't that the 365, mm -hmm. and they're working on that. Is that correct? Um, that's that's what they said. I thought that, but I thought that it was back to you and Mary Ann. Yeah, I think it's Smith. back to yeah. you and me. Yes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of heard both things. That Wait, yeah. it's I, back to who? I think it's back to Brian. Mm -hmm. and Mary. That's what I had in my notes. Oh, okay. Yeah. They had also mentioned about doing some different versions of things, but yeah, so we'll all yeah, that's we'll what we're getting yeah. together on Thursday. So. Yes, okay. good. Um, we've got HRC's end of year report and environmental commission end of year report. Um, we um, and we need to tell you this: there will be an executive session um, personnel for the review of the village manager. I think the May fifteenth. Yes. And um, then the only other thing we have, June 5th, well, we'll have a couple of resolutions, second or a reading of the a second reading of the ordinance, um, and then we agreed to put the lodging tax on the June 5th agenda. Uh, Are you planning to bring a resolution regarding the, the permanent chief to the June 5th meeting? I wasn't quite sure of your time frame there. Um, let's put it on the agenda just as a placeholder. Um, I think that would if 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 it, it'll it's a bit, if it works I think that's the goal there um, I let's let's clarify the lodging tax um, situation and what is going to happen on June 5th is it just a discussion item uh, that's what I have it in my calendar to bring back is a discussion discussion item, item. okay um, I can get a sample legislation from another uh, another area if you want but I mean I, I don't think that's first of all we got to decide if we want to if we want to right. go in that right. direction and I do believe that there are restrictions in the ORC as to what that funding can be used for I believe so yes um, so that and I will just say ahead of time I'm going to be recusing myself from that um, so I won't even be in the room and I I'm sorry did you also were you looking for any kind of recommendation from the or input back from the manager's advisory board regarding uh, broadband municipal broadband on that June 5th um, I think well, that's we should put it we should put it on there yeah let's put know. it on for June 5th they may want to come back I feel like that it may 15th agenda is too full for to put yeah, that back I don't on. think they're gonna be ready anyway so no, let's put no, for June 5th let's put the fiber advisory report okay thanks Judy for remembering um, can I get a motion to adjourn so move. So move. Second. Second. <laughs> Favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Can we all agree that?